Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, Parallel Deku, back with another fanfiction. This is the movie of, what if Deku Epic had San Control Quirk? Now before starting, please give this video a like, and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. One wrong turn. That was all it took to change Izuku Midoriya's fate. A single turn made absent-mindedly. Izuku one minute was heading home from school, in a poor mood much like every day nowadays. He had kept his head down and just walked not aware of the wrong turn he took. And then the next minute Izuku was on his back in the snow, a burn across his collarbone with debris from a wall all around him. An explosion destroyed a portion of the wall right next to the ten-year-old kid. Then one of the most painful moments of Izuku's life began as he felt burning hot metal grab onto him. Moments earlier, Endeavor got to the door and only listened for a second, hearing the chanting of that damned cult that confirmed he was at the correct spot. He was going to put them down before any more people were turned into sacrifices for their god. He heated up a fist and used that heat to punch a door right off of its hinges and into the room, surprising the people inside who were in the middle of a ritual. It's a hero someone on the outside of the arcane symbol drawn on the floor said. Don't stop the ritual another black cloaked person on the outside of the circle shouted. You damned fanatics are done. Endeavor slammed a fist over the head of the first person to try to stop him from ending their continued ritual that Endeavor didn't feel like understanding. All he knew was that they were killing people in this and that makes them a group of villains that he needs to pound into the ground. We must summon our lord. A cultist made his arms into sharp spikes and tried to impale Endeavor, only for the flaming hero to use his fire to blast the fanatic into a wall. Obscura exerso tibi domino mio fructum. Planum quad percu the leading cultist was cut off mid-chant by Endeavor flaring his fire intensely to take down most of them in one move and destroy parts of the arcane symbols drawn all over the area. Endeavor had not noticed the symbols actually glowing prior to his flare. You fool a cultist yelled. You have ruined the summo. Endeavor cut the cultist off with another attack, not caring about what the fanatics are going to say. A cultist with four arms charged the flaming hero, only to get struck down immediately. The leading cultist was still awake and grabbed a now half-burnt book, not even trying to crawl away. He opened the book to a random page hoping it was something that would provide help and shouted another line. Afford, see quit a re domino obscuro eo. The sound of thunder was heard right as Endeavor burned the man, igniting the book completely that was dropped and forgotten about as it started to burn away. You shall now feel the wrath of the Dark Lord the man shouted through his pain right as an explosion erupted from the cultist and destroyed the area. Endeavor coughed as he pushed a piece of the wall off of him to see the damage. He was fine and thought everything was resolved until he heard it. A child screaming in intense pain. Endeavor thought that one of the cultists, if any were still somehow able to move after that explosion, must have grabbed a child as a hostage. The flaming man quickly made his way to the edge of the building where a large hole in the wall was that allowed him to see outside. Instead of seeing a cultist holding a child hostage he saw a kid surrounded by dark, why red fire that was coming from metal on his arms. The kid actively tried to shove one of the metal pieces off to no success, not even budging it an inch but hurt his arm in the process. Endeavor jumped off of the ledge down to the kid to try to rein in the fire, only to have to take a step back as the heat from the dark flames that were emanating from the child were too intense for even Endeavor to be near without needing to be concerned. The snow around the child had melted into water immediately. He couldn't even help the boy as he witnessed the flames visibly burning him in several spots. The flaming hero actually felt panic as he had flashbacks to the fate of his first son. He had to help this kid somehow. And then the flames suddenly stopped. All of the flames just extinguished fast and the boy fell over, falling unconscious. The child still had that metal on his forearms and it was traced with dark red, like lava almost. Endeavor just looked at the boy in shock for a minute, not sure how to know how to react anymore. He didn't move until a person spoke. He, he is the Dark Lord's chosen vessel a somehow conscious cultist responded to seeing the scene. He sounded ecstatic about it. The Dark Lord is among us. Endeavor responded by firing a blast of fire at the man that knocked him off his feet and right into unconsciousness. Not wanting to hear another cultist speak for a while if he can help it he ignored the man's limp body and went to check on the boy and get him to a hospital. This was a new experience for Endeavor. Actually feeling panic like this and being at the hospital to make sure a civilian is okay. He had never felt so shaken as when the child, whose identity was revealed as Izuku Midoriya, had screamed in such intense agony, more pain than Endeavor thinks he has ever seen someone be in. Even now while the child was unconscious he had a pained expression. The dark fire had left numerous burns on the ten-year-old child but the doctors had found it odd how easily they were treated, all except the burn across his collarbone. Speaking of flames it was something that bothered Endeavor. He saw those flames come from the blackened metal bracers that were seemingly fused to the boy's forearms 
not even budging a bit. He knows they had to have come from that thing, especially when he learned the boy was quirkless, or at least labeled as such. It made him actually believe that insane cultist who claimed that the child had become a vessel for something. As much as Endeavor thought it was also stupid for something like that to be true, it was also more believable than the child spontaneously gaining a quirk like that in that very exact moment. No one else was even around to cause the fire either. This was why he was watching the interrogation of the cultist who had also witnessed whatever happened to the boy. Maybe he could get an explanation. What were you trying to accomplish with this ritual? The police officer asked the cultist, a man named Jin Akoi, who was handcuffed to the table. Where is the Dark Lord Leviat's vessel? Jin asked his own question. Not caring about anything else but the boy he knows was blessed to be the vessel. The child's current situation is not of your concern. The officer would be damned if he let slip any information on the kid to any of the cultists. Who knows what the crazy fanatics would do now that one of them was claiming Izuku was the vessel of their god. Luckily for the child only one of the cultists was even conscious or there to see the fire. I must tend to Lord Leviat and his meats. Jin gained a scowl. What was the ritual supposed to even accomplish? Summon this lord of yours. Yes, we would have brought the great lord to earth in his full glorious form but that heathen of fire had to interrupt the process. The cultist spoke with Venom when he mentioned Endeavor, who had a blank look hiding his annoyance at being called a heathen as he listened. His intrusion forced the Lord Leviat to have to take on a vessel before his true power can take place. The police officer did his best to keep a blank expression, but he really felt like just calling the cultist an idiot. So this ritual requires the killing of fifteen individuals? The Dark Lord requires souls. They served a great purpose, Jin replied without shame. The chief of police for the precinct, standing next to Endeavor, made a content sound. At least they admit to the murders and we don't have to jump hoops for that. I want to understand more. Endeavor spoke. If the boy is quirkless and none of these fools have flame-based quirks then that fire has no explanation. The police chief, a gray-skinned man with tusks, nodded. I understand the curiosity. Me and the detectives have it too. They are running a test on Midoriya to see if it was a quirk awakening. That should be the case if anything. I doubt these people and their beliefs are right and they summoned a god or devil. I request the book of our Lord Leviat, Jin said from inside the room. The chief looked at a book that was actually next to him on a table, almost burnt completely during the event. He must mean this book you said the leader had. I don't think any of them should have this again. Endeavor picked it up. He opened it to look through the pages but stopped at one page that was still readable, but in a language Endeavor had no knowledge of. He had stopped at the sight of something very specific. Those bracers, the ones on that boy's arms. They were drawn on the page of the book that looked like it had been made long before Endeavor was born and even before Quirks first appeared. There was no way this was drawn in between the time the boy had been found with them and now. He would initially just assume those pieces of armor were born on the kid but his file had said nothing on them. Was this real? Was this cult's Dark Lord real and somehow in the kid? No. The man shook that thought out but it didn't leave completely. It was unexplainable how exactly he has the armor and fire, but there couldn't be any way an evil god or whatever was real. Right. Everything was painful. That was what Izuku had first realized when he slowly regained consciousness. He felt like he was in pain, especially his forearms. Opening his eyes he had to squint from the light. On impulse he tried to sit up and felt sore, but forgot about it when he heard someone speak. Midoriya, you are awake. It was a doctor, an aged man who had a tired but kind look. If I were honest I didn't think you would wake up till tomorrow at the earliest. What happened? Izuku asked, right before he remembered what happened. You were caught in a villain attack and badly burnt. The doctor wasn't given the full details past the child being badly burnt by flames and that the metal bracers on the kid were a part of him. He found it odd how people were being secretive about it but he instead focused on healing the child, who was healing surprisingly quick for not having someone use a regenerative type quirk on him. Izuku remembered the fire then. That dark, red fire that was the worst thing he had experienced in life. He then remembered those things, the metal that latched onto his arms. He tried to move his arms and felt added weight to them. Right as he looked down at his arms and saw the blackened metal he let out a hiss from a spasm of pain, right along his collarbone. Please don't overexert yourself son. The doctor asked as he moved over. You have bad injuries from the event. Why do I Izuku stop talking when the door to the room opened and the number two pro hero Endeavor of all people walked in the room? The child gained a look of shock. Endeavor, the Hellflame hero looked surprised to see Izuku awake, as did the man with tusks who had followed him in. Endeavor did respond though with a nod as he turned to the doctor. I take it his recovery is going good. The man sounded almost guilty or sad to Izuku. Why? He is up earlier than expected. The doctor nodded. How are you feeling son? The man with tusks, who Izuku realized was a police officer by the uniform, asked. Izuku felt pain in his collarbone and his arms, especially his forearms where the metal was. He gave a weak smile. I am okay. All three adults in the room all had the same thought. 
knowing full well that the kid was downplaying his pain. However, none of them called him out on it though. Endeavor held up the book again to look at the page and the bracers on Izuku, seeing how the detail was extremely spot on. He looked at the chief next to him and handed the book to him, before turning to Izuku. I am glad to see you are okay after that incident boy. The man couldn't put into words how it felt to not see the kid die from those flames. Those screams of pain etching their self into his mind. Thank you Mr. Endeavor. Izuku replied, then thought for a second. Was that your fight I was by? The man nodded. Yes. The police chief turned to the doctor. May we have the room please? I swear it will be just a moment. The aged doctor nodded. Take your time. I will be going up and down the hall checking on patients if you need me. He took his leave at that point. Once the doctor had left the two men left had turned to Izuku, but didn't speak. They didn't know how to word what had to be the truth, no matter how crazy it was. And they had to tell the child most of all, it affecting him primarily. They didn't speak for a moment and it made Izuku nervous. Am I in trouble? Izuku asked. He was beginning to think that being near the villain attack made him get in trouble. At that both of the adults actually responded with a shake of the head. You are not in trouble Midoriya. The police chief stated. Perhaps it will be easier to explain when your parents get here. Endeavor suggested. Being new to this type of situation made it confusing to word what was needed to be said. Izuku then realized his mom had to have known by now, and that worried him because didn't want his mom to worry. Her mother should be here any minute. The chief stated. She had started on her way here the second she was informed of your injuries. Not even five minutes later Izuku's mother, Inko Midoriya, had arrived. Inko was a short woman with some weight and noticeable worry lines on her face, as well as emerald hair just like her son. How is my son? She asked right as she noticed him awake and looking at his arms, where her attention wasn't yet. She was too busy seeing the burn marks on him, especially the one wrapping around the left part of his collarbone. Izu what happened? She asked as she had to hold herself back from hugging him to comfort him, knowing it could hurt his injuries if she did. Miss Midoriya, the police chief said, I am Chief Akimoi. We have something we have to inform you about your son. Inko then noticed Endeavor and then the metal on her son's arms. What happened to Izu? As insane, as it sounds, Endeavor started as Akimoi offered her the burnt book of the cult, open to the page of interest. Somehow a cult has done something and it has made your son have the power to create powerful flames. Inko didn't even know where to begin with this. A burnt book had those things drawn from her son's arms. One of the most powerful pro-heroes was telling her that her son was affected by a cult, a cult even being here at all, and her son somehow having a quirk now. It was all a bit much. I don't understand. She said to sum up her confusion. I can create fire. Izuku asked, showing where his focus was now. As I attempted to take down the cult they were doing some sort of ritual. I don't want to believe it but somehow the process worked in some way, even with my intervention. And it resulted in the boy having those pieces of armor appear on him and the flames come out. Endeavor explained. Inko looked at the blackened bracers. The metal that appeared burnt with the dark crimson glowing tracing that was like lava was on it. The bracers seemed harmless at the moment, not even leaving anything on the bed that Izuku was on. I see. She didn't know if she truly believed it all though. I made that fire. The emerald kid asked quietly as he looked at the bracers that covered a majority of his forearms. We have no reason to believe this insane idea that something supernatural like this has actually happened, the police chief stated. However all of the evidence points to it being supernatural. That book is quite old and that drawing is too exact for it to just be coincidence. I can make fire. Izuku still whispered to himself, in disbelief of that intense fire being his own. If this is true Inko didn't want to believe it really, but she had to be safe on both sides. How would he control this fire? We are not sure how any of this works. He has still tested negative for having a quirk. The police chief stated, that fire could have only have come from him, none of the cult had a fire quirk. What about Inko didn't want to say his name but had meant Endeavor, the man known for his strong flames. It could have been that Endeavor set the fire without noticing. I assure you ma'am it was not me. These flames are on a different level from mine. Izuku wasn't even listening anymore to their discussion of any possible explanation for the fire. He was looking at the metal bracers on his arms. The blackened metal and parts that looked like they could have been dark lava flowing around the metal. It was painful to have them on, like it was burning him just enough to get his attention. But in that moment he was looking at them it seemed like the pain was gone. It felt like something in them was calling to Izuku, a feeling. A very dark feeling. Izuku couldn't help but reach out to it. The second he did, an explosion of dark fire burst from him and shook the hospital room. Seconds later, Endeavor made a groan as he got up, having to throw a cart off of himself. He scanned the area to check the damage and saw the dark flames that were surrounding Izuku at that moment. The fire swirling around the boy like a white tornado. Stop Izuku shouted through his pain as he tried to rein in his flames somehow. It was causing pain all over his body to try and control the fire. 
But the boy refused the idea of giving up on trying to control the dark flames. He struggled as he actually felt himself gain ground on the task he had no idea how to do as he managed to get the flames to actually disappear. He had raw hands from the task and was breathing heavily as he looked at the bracers that had a dark red glow to them, like the fire was ready to leak out again against his control. The child's arms felt like they were on fire as he tried to control his breathing that had become broken and erratic. Endeavor turned off the flames he had activated on impulse and saw how burnt everything around them had become in the small amount of time that the fire had been active. Endeavor himself had been sent through a wall by the blast. Looking around the man saw that both Chief Akimoy and the boy's mother were both knocked under fallen pieces of the wall as well. He went to check on them quickly while Izuku didn't move, just sitting there with a scared expression as he looked at the bracers on his arms. Ma'am are you okay? Endeavor asked Inko as he lifted the debris off of her. He got no response and saw that she was unconscious, and her right side had a large burn running down the side of her face from by her ear to her neck. He didn't have to check on Akimoy as help from down the hall had showed up. What happened? A nurse asked in shock as she tried to get over the broken room to help anyone that was hurt. Endeavor just looked at the boy. The terrified and pain look on Izuku's face still there. He's not breathing a doctor shouted as he tried to check on a Kimoi. Right before he tried to move the man and found a piece of the door impaled through the man's back. Later the mess had been cleaned up and the newly injured Inko and Akimoi were in the ICU being treating for intense burns and the debris that had pierced Akimoi's lung. Izuku, who somehow had less injuries than he should have had, was moved to an isolated room in an area of the hospital that dealt with quirks that were out of control. The ten-year-old child had a scared expression as he just sat in the room, not able to shake the image from his mind of his mom who had serious burns all over and had to be taken away quickly. Because of him, it was that fire's fault that his mother was hurt. He looked at the bracers, the ashen metal that had somehow fused themselves to his forearms. The objects gave off a warmth, primarily from the parts that glowed a crimson red. Izuku didn't know how he was chosen or why, but he felt like it was a curse. Those objects, which felt like they were stinging his arms just to have on them, had to be a curse. What other word for them was there? Endeavor didn't react at all when he had a bandage applied to his forehead, or when he was dismissed as in good condition. He had too much on his mind that he didn't pay attention to much of anything around him. His body having gone on autopilot and leading him to the street outside of the hospital. That was the moment he finally was aware of his surroundings. And then he looked back at the hospital. The situation was stuck in his head. A situation he couldn't help but feel like he was directly responsible for. It was something that was just gnawing away at his mind. That pain-filled scream that the boy had because of the fire he had mysteriously gained. Part of him still wanted to deny that explanation of it somehow being in relation to the cult but everything pointed to them. If it was indeed the cult's fault does that not include Endeavor himself as well? He had interrupted their damned ritual to arrest them and this was the result. If it were so then Endeavor was definitely a guilty party here as well. Guilty in giving an uninvolved kid fire that was the strongest Endeavor has ever encountered and was hard to control. Doesn't that also make the accident in the hospital Endeavor's fault as well? A child being told they have powers would of course try to use those powers, especially one who was previously told he would be one of the few born without powers. But this fire was on another level and has injured a police officer and the child's own mother. To the pro-hero, the whole situation just fell back on him, a heavy feeling in his from that conclusion. He looked back at the hospital and again remembered that scream of pain that made him remember his own child's death by his own fire. Remembering that, the man walked back into the building, pulling out his phone as he did. Not soon later Endeavor was led into the room where the boy Izuku was. When the flaming hero entered he saw the boy sitting on the floor against a wall. The emerald-haired kid looked up in surprise at seeing the second-highest-ranking hero of Japan again. Endeavor, Izuku asked in confusion, wondering why the man was here again. Was he mad at Izuku for potentially harming him earlier? Boy Midoriya, Endeavor felt like referring to the kid as boy wouldn't fit the setting. I have an offer for you. The kid's eyes went wide. An offer, for him, from Endeavor. What could this be? What? That fire you have in your possession it is strong and from what I can tell hard to control for you. I am offering my assistance in helping you gain control of it to stop any further accidents. Izuku kept his surprised expression. Did he just get offered a chance to be trained by the number two hero in Japan? The guy who is regarded as having the most powerful fire quirk in the world. His jaw admittedly dropped into an O that showed his surprise more. Before he could answer though a jolt of pain flashed from his forearms, coming from the bracers. The pain took all of Izuku's attention and he yelped as he clutched his own arms. Endeavor gained a frown at the sudden pain Izuku got. It made him hope just that much more that the boy would accept his offer. Izuku looked back up at the hero and tried to hide his pain with a faked expression of being happy. He was truly happy that he just got such a huge offer, but the pain he just felt was just more bearing at the moment. Do you mean as a student? The flaming hero wanted to pursue that pain Izuku just obviously had but felt like answering the question would be better. 
Indeed as a student, I believe that my years of mastering my own fire can assist you in mastering your own fire. Izuku nodded. Yes I mean okay. I accept the kid tried to underplay how enthusiastic he was about being offered the teachings, which admittedly endeavor like. Okay, the man nodded. I have spoken to the doctor overseeing you and he has given the okay for you to leave and come with me at any point so we can get right to figuring out that fire. Izuku stood up eagerly but then stopped. What about mom? Endeavor was glad he had asked about the woman before coming to Izuku with the proposal. Your mother will be alright. At the rate things have been going she will make it out of this. The flaming hero had also admittedly paid for the bill as well, feeling guilty over being the cause of the mess in the boy's life. During the meantime I believe your father will be able to watch over you. Izuku showed no happy reaction to that. I oh I don't know my dad. While Endeavor went from feeling guilty to just feeling awkward, he had a blank look for a second before shaking it off. I suppose the least I could do is make accommodations past here for your training. Follow me Bo Midoriya. He fixed himself before he called Izuku boy again and went out the door. Okay. The emerald child followed him out, ignoring the constant pain from his forearms. A while later and the flaming hero and his new student were at a training room on Endeavor's property that wouldn't burn down from Izuku's flames since it was built to withstand intense fire as a way for Endeavor to train at his limits. The flaming man decided to see how Izuku can even summon his fire. The supernatural origin of his fire making it feel like it might work differently from his own hellflame. How did you summon your fire back in the hospital? The emerald protein thought for a second. I felt this feeling in my arms not my arms but these. He wiggled his arms to indicate the bracers. It felt like something I could just reach and grab. So it was like a quirk endeavor thought. That made it easier to work with. For a second he was worried he would have to teach Izuku whatever language the cult was using and he would have to use it like spells or something. Describe the feeling. Can you sense it now? Izuku closed his eyes and just tried to feel his forearms mentally. I I can. It feels dark and really warm. This was getting easier for Endeavor. The boy's fire was sounding closer and closer to his own with every answer. The closer it was the easier it would be for him to pass on his knowledge. I want you to reach out for that sensation, but do not try to completely grasp it. Picture it as if you are just trying to press the tip of your index finger onto it. He wouldn't have Izuku go to his limit because from what Endeavor can assume, the fire was feisty and difficult to control and full power would be disastrous to try to use right out of the gate. He didn't want this kid to push too far and end up like Taoya. Izuku nodded and tried to picture reaching for his energy the same way that Endeavor said. He reached out for that dark feeling, something in him egging him to grasp the entirety of the power. He fought the urge and focused on just tapping the feeling. Fire sparked to life all over his bracers, the red flames flowing around and going off a warmth to them. Endeavor actually smirked at the scene, proud that the kid just took to his lesson that quickly. Suddenly the fire sparked again and became ten times as intense, the flames encompassing every part of Izuku's arms. Ah the boy yelped as he tried to picture no longer touching the feeling, it not feeling like it was working. If anything it felt like the sensation had moved itself to make more of Izuku's pictured hand touch it. Endeavor had activated his own fire on impulse to make sure he doesn't get burnt by Izuku's own. Try to extinguish the flames. I'm trying Izuku cried as the pain that was now just a constant got more intense like the flames. The flaming hero got an idea. If you need it, picture that sensation being covered and blocked up from being near you. He wasn't sure it would work, just being the first thought to enter his head. There wasn't anything that said it wouldn't. Supernatural stuff didn't exactly have set rules. Izuku nodded as he tried to ignore the pain and just focus on the fire, which was not an easy task. Izuku couldn't properly focus on a wall of any kind so in honesty he pictured him grabbing the power and throwing it away from him. The fire roared more intensely for a second where he was grabbing it more and then calmed down significantly afterwards. The pain numbed down as well and then Izuku could properly focus and then tried to imagine a wall to separate him from the power. Endeavor had watched with worry and curiosity, but once it was over all he could do was not. He shouldn't have expected a smooth learning process with this, however at least he knew better now and Izuku had a way to turn the fire off and on. Even if it was a time-consuming and focus-requiring at the moment, for now it would suffice. He looked at Izuku. Do you think you can turn it on and off again? First I say we work on your ability to be able to summon and extinguish your flames. Izuku nodded, ignoring his stinging arms that did not have any serious burns like they should. I can do it. A few hours later and Izuku was lying on the floor completely exhausted and numb. Falling on his fire just made that constant stinging pain get worse. They had spent the entire day just working in Izuku's ability to summon and extinguish his fire, and the swap to Endeavor testing Izuku's physical capabilities. A category of training Endeavor only thought to explore in case the boy's body being stronger could mean more control over the unnatural flames. In all honesty Endeavor thought that there was nothing noteworthy about Izuku's physical capabilities from the beginning. The kid had no muscle to his appearance but was shockingly decent despite it. 
Endeavor assumed the kid either had hidden strength or the supernatural powers Izuku had were no just the ability to create and manipulate fire. At the least the man assumed Izuku had to have a side power of strong resistance to fire or a stronger healing factor than regular people. That is enough for now. The flaming man announced when Izuku sat up on the ground. We have no idea the effects of overusing your power so we should do best to not find out. Okay. The emerald protein nodded, trying to ignore his stinging arms. Tomorrow we will pick back up with the practice of mastering your ability to create and extinguish those flames again. Right now that is the only step with your flames that should be practiced so that accidents can be quickly avoided. The man explained while Izuku just nodded. Due to your situation there is a room here that you can use until your mother is out of the hospital. The protein stood up and exhaled heavily, the pain making him feel exhausted. Yes sensei. That actually caught the man off guard, being responded to politely by a kid he was training, something he didn't experience with his son Shoto. Speaking of Shoto, he just realized that he hadn't even thought about his son the whole time and was supposed to be training him at the moment. However he actually felt that this was a better spent session of training. Izuku being respectful and actually using his fire instead of being defiant. That and Izuku's powers being chaotic making this training a necessity. He looked over at Izuku and for a second had the thought enter his mind of considering leading the protein down the path of Endeavor's own goal of surpassing All Might. But that thought had actually left his mind as soon as it appeared. It felt wrong to give the child a goal like that with his unique situation. This is the room you will have for now, the flaming man said as he opened the door to the room that was clean and organized, like it was set up and never used or at least not for a while. Thank you sensei, Izuku said in gratitude of the generosity of his new teacher. If Izuku were honest his mind was still wrapping itself around him having Endeavor of all people as a personal teacher. His fire was also something mind-boggling to Izuku, but after spending a whole day training with it he was more used to it. The pain that was just a constant at this point for Izuku was among the few things Izuku hated about this situation however, that and what he had done to his mother. Not even hesitating for a second on the thought of it Izuku dropped onto the bed and tried to fall asleep, ignoring the stinging in his arms as best he could. The next morning Izuku woke up feeling only slightly physically exhausted, his arms heavy with numbness. However, he felt incredibly mentally exhausted due to his inability to properly sleep throughout the night. For a second he had almost forgotten the events of the previous day and was confused about where he was. He was at Endeavor's actual home, as a student of his, and had gained the ability to create fire. It was a lot for Izuku to process even then. It felt like maybe he was dreaming the whole time. He sat up and looked at the metal pieces of burnt armor on his forearms, glad to see they don't burn things around him like the bed. He felt a stinging in the metal and made a sound of pain, the stinging becoming something he wished would stop. He got off of the bed and decided to go find his teacher, hoping the man would be awake at this point. Walking out of the room he was given he realized it would be kind of weird for him to just walk around the pro hero's estate randomly. He had already left the room however so he decided to just go back to the training room he had used the day prior. Right as he turned a corner however he walked right into someone. Izuku had stumbled back a step from the encounter and so did the person he had knocked into. Sorry the emerald kid blurted out as he made sure he didn't fall over. It's my fault. I wasn't watching where I was going. The person apologized themselves. The person was a young woman with turquoise eyes and white hair that was flecked with traces of crimson in multiple spots. After a split second she blinked and looked at Izuku. Wait, who are you? How did you get in here? She took a step back and got defensive despite the supposed intruder being a 10-year-old. Izuku actually panicked for a second like he was caught trespassing before he mentally slapped himself and answered with the truth. Endeavor Sensei gave me a room here until my mom is out of the hospital. The woman looked confused for a second. Father has a student. She looked at Izuku with studious eyes. He just made me a student yesterday Izuku was really wishing he would stop sounding so panicked because it was ruining his credibility. I see. The woman nodded like she wanted to believe Izuku but was still hesitant. Why did he offer to teach you? Izuku was about to answer but got cut off by the gruff voice of Endeavor. Midoriya, you are awake. The flaming man had just entered the hallway and stood behind the girl Izuku bumped into. Endeavor Izuku said admittedly louder than he meant to. Father, the woman said, making Izuku actually click it in his mind that she was Endeavor's kid. Which should have been obvious but Izuku apparently couldn't process anything that morning. Fayumi, the man greeted his daughter. This is Midoriya. He has become a student of mine to learn how to control his chaotic quirk. Speaking of that, let's get to it L, Midoriya, if you are up to it. Yes Sensei Izuku nodded as he moved around Fayumi and down the hall. Fayumi gave a look over her shoulder at her father and his new pupil and had worry for a second that Endeavor was as harsh with the kid as the man was with his own son and family. Hearing Midoriya say his mother was in the hospital didn't exactly lower her concern either. Once in the training room Endeavor spoke to Izuku. Midoriya, I recommend you do not tell people at all about the origins of your fire. What? The Emerald Kid asked in confusion before he got the point. 
Is it because of that cult? Endeavor nodded. In part, yes. You should be wary of any member of that cult. Luckily just the one individual had seen you and only just that. Most of them are arrested and at this point not in contact with each other. But word of their god having a vessel must have been, or should be treated like it has been spread around. Fanatics will be after you and we don't know or should let them get the chance to do whatever it is those people would have done to you. Understood. Izuku nodded. That and I do not believe most people might take kindly to any power with an origin like yours. A power created by a cult that is initially hard to control and as strong as my own fire is something that I believe won't get a welcoming reception. I do not want you to tell anyone at all or even hint at your power's origin. The story is that you happen to have gained your quirk unusually late. Understood. The Emerald Pertine nodded again. I understand. He then winced as a shock of pain flashed from his arms. How do I stop the pain? The man gained an expression of concern. The pain still affecting you. Izuku nodded. It doesn't stop and sometimes gets stronger for a second before going back down. I always feel it though. The flaming man frowned. He had assumed and hoped the boy just looked like that as a default and wasn't actually in pain the entire time. He didn't even have a good answer at all. I do not know, but chances are with that better control the less pain there will be. Izuku nodded again and then manipulated the fire to his bracers. I'm ready to train then he said with enthusiasm as he ignored his pain. Endeavor nodded and smiled at the enthusiasm. Then let's not waste any more time. A week later, Inko was able to leave the hospital finally. Her burns being treated to the best possible condition they could have been put to. She had a permanent scar now that was on the side of her face, the right side and the mark went from in front of her ear to near the back of her jaw and onto her neck. When she exited the hospital there was no one waiting for her and she wasn't surprised, but also disheartened at still not seeing her son all week. She had woken up three days previously and had heard he was with a teacher who was helping him with his newfound fire. But she wasn't told who the teacher was as even the doctors were not told for the most part, being told the teacher wanted anonymity. She was hoping Izuku would show up, however, not sure how he was feeling at all with his power and the accident. She supposed the most she can do is go home at the moment. Miss Midoriya. A deep voice got her attention and Inko turned to actually see Endeavor of all people. Endeavor Inko couldn't help but speak in a panicked nature at the man's presence. The man didn't even need his hero suit to be imposing, the sweater and slacks not diminishing that at all. In fact he didn't even have his beard and face lit up with his fire like he normally does even if he isn't in his hero suit. What do I have the honor of seeing you? Endeavor put out a hand and lowered it. Please keep to a normal tone. I don't really want attention on the situation. He asked politely, something that was foreign for anyone who knew him. Is something wrong? Inko immediately wanted to panic. Where is Izuku? Midoriya is currently training to control his fire. The man answered. I apologize for not exactly letting him come out to see you. He made a motion for her to follow him as he began walking away. What happened to my son? Inko asked as she caught up to Endeavor. I didn't think it would be wise for him to be in the public right now. That fire he has is not exactly easy to control. Endeavor explained in a quiet tone to not let people really overhear them. I apologize as well for taking over an authority on the boy that I had no right to. He has been out of school this whole week as well because of me. He has. Inko was more concerned on Izuku's current health than Endeavor admitting to acting as the legal say and such for her son while she was hospitalized. Is it that difficult to handle? She unconsciously touched the burn scar she got from the topic of their conversation. Yes and no. Endeavor replied as they got in a car. It seems to be something that fluctuates on what control is needed. I believe a trick is needed that I might not be aware of. Normally Endeavor's pride was something that would prevent him from wanting to admit he was wrong or not capable of something. But the supernatural element of this situation has negated that in him for the most part. That didn't help the woman's growing concern over the situation. Please take me to my son. The man nodded. We were already on our way. Izuku was on his back, breathing heavily as he tried to avoid cursing. His arms had started stinging even worse just seconds prior from trying to keep his flames reined in and controlled on just the bracers. He had held the flames too long and it sent several waves of pain up his arms and even through his. It was making him mad that control was so difficult to get. Any real progress stopping days ago. A knock came at the door and it opened a few seconds later without a response. Fayumi Todoroki opening the door. For the past week she has been checking in a few times a day to make sure Izuku would be alright and that he wasn't overdoing anything. In actuality she was trying to make sure that Endeavor wasn't pushing Izuku too hard like he had done in the past to his own children. But so far all she could see was Izuku being the one to do all the pushing himself. In fact her father was more in the side of trying to make the child not overdo things. Something she found bizarre given history. Midori I heard a scream. She stated, hoping he wouldn't give a poor response. It was nothing. Izuku exhaled as he looked up at the ceiling. A poor response, again. The girl sighed. Over the week she at first thought Izuku was an easily startled pertine at first but it was like his personality was shifting. 
even if she herself didn't actually know him long enough to actually make that claim. She knew Endeavor wasn't even at home right now so whatever happened was all Izuku. Would you like some tea? She offered it hoping he would take the offer and quit training for a single moment. She didn't think he had actually gone anywhere in the house during his stay past Taoya's old room that he was given in the training room. She knows for sure that he hasn't actually met Shoto or Natsuo yet, and that her little brothers weren't even aware of Izuku being there at all. As far as she knew, Shoto was confused about Endeavor's seemingly leaving him alone and not questioning why. Izuku didn't respond for a second before he sat up with a groan. I would like tea. He accepted the offer for the first time all week. Fayumi smiled. Great she waited a second for him to stand up. The child not trying to hide his pained expression. She had noticed that he always seemed to look in pain or discomfort and it was concerning. A moment later they were drinking the tea on the patio near the back of the house. Izuku admittedly was happy for the moment that he was not training, catching his breath after not doing much of that all day. Do you know when you will be able to go back to school? Fayumi asked. At first she was confused over his not being anywhere but the house all week but Endeavor had explained Izuku's recent discovery of his quirk and poor handle on its immense power. I don't think it should be that much longer. The Emerald Kid replied. He hadn't even put much thought into school in all honesty. It was a second thought for the most part. Now however he was wondering how different everything would be when he returned. He doubted he could hide the fact that he has fire now for more than a minute. No doubt the whole of his school would all shine a light on the quirkless kid who gained a quirk several years after he was supposed to, especially fire as chaotic as his. I bet your friends will be happy to see you after this. The kid gained discomfort to his already pained expression. I don't have those. Fayumi frowned. While Izuku didn't seem to be a person with pleasant vibes from her perspective he was still polite and not rude. An idea popped into her head about her little brother. Perhaps she can get them to meet. Odds are these two might end up being friends. She couldn't make it obvious though. At that moment the back door was open and Endeavor, with Inko following, had come out. There you are Midoriya, the flaming hero said. After returning to his house with Inko he figured Izuku would be still training. Izu Inko moved to her son quickly and hugged him hard. Are you okay? Izuku froze up having his mother hug him. He had seen her scars for a brief second before she hugged him and it bothered him, knowing he was the reason. I'm sorry. Izuku spoke shakily. What? Inko let go of her son and looked at him with a confused expression. It's my fault you got hurt. The Emerald Woman's confusion turned to sadness. Izu, that was not your fault. It was my fire I was the one who tried to use something I had no idea how to control. Izu, you had no idea it would be hard. I still did it. Izuku, it is not your fault. It was just an accident. Inko wasn't going to let her son just blame himself over an accident like this. She then held his hand up to look at one of the metal bracers that were fused to her son. Show me your progress. She was genuinely interested in the fire her son had gained, even if it had a sinister origin. Izuku nodded and stood up. Okay. Back in the training room a minute later Izuku recreated his process to create his fire, tapping the sensation and making the dark flames flare to life on his bracers. The fire made Inko flinch for all of a second when she remembered the last time she saw them. But it was replaced with a bit of pride to see her son actually have a power of his own, even if it had one of the strangest stories to how it came to be. Izuku ignored the prickling feeling that was growing more painful in his arms and instead tried to make them grow more to show that aspect but overshot the control and the fire spiked to a high level that encased his entire arms. The Emerald Kid bit his lip with a groan of pain as he forced the powers to go away, using the mental practice to shut the dark fire down. It only took a few seconds compared to how poor his control was at first. I can create and extinguish them now, Izuku said to his mother. For now in his training we are focusing on his ability to just do that, creating and ending the fire, Endeavor stated. With what I believe to be the base level, or at least what was seen when the flames first appeared, is a level of intensity close to my own he should focus on being able to shut it down so as to avoid damaging his surrounding. Inko looked at the bracers on her son's forearms again. Are they there permanently, like they are fused to him? The flaming man nodded. Izuku felt a shock of pain and managed to keep it from affecting his expression. The fire-like parts don't actually burn anything around me all the time. They just feel warm. He does experience small amounts of pain that seem to happen at random with no pattern to them. For the most part they only get stronger when he uses the fire. Endeavor revealed. You are in pain. Inko looked at her son with concern. Not that much I barely notice it Izuku lied quickly. He was afraid he would be banned from using the power if she knew how much pain was really in his arms. Inko didn't give a response to that, wanting to say something but hesitating. I theorized that perhaps more control equals less pain most likely, so a few weeks from now it could be completely gone. Endeavor stated. Inko didn't even say anything about the decision of her son being trained here at the man's home without her say-so, feeling that given the circumstances and care into it that she can allow it. If a few weeks is all it should take then that is good. I don't want you to fall behind on your school work anymore though Izuku. 
I want you to at least get your missing assignments and catch up. I also have a suggestion as to Midoriya's situation. Endeavor coughed. I think that given his powers beginning from that cult he and everyone who knows that it is truly supernatural should keep it an absolute secret. People might not react in a good way to them with the truth. The story that I believe might be best is that Midoriya gained his quirk unusually late. I understand. The Emerald Mother nodded. Wait, what about that group that caused this? Most of them are arrested. They have found a book that actually details what the names of any not yet arrested members are. That group, the Disciples of Leviat, were not all present when I went after them last week, nor do they only operate in Japan. Speaking of that, Midoriya should have those metal pieces covered up if he can. I am not sure if all of that cult actually have seen that page with the drawing but a risk should not be taken. If this is going to be called a quirk then he will have to register it also. Inko said, Izu do you have a name in mind? Izuku paused in thought. He didn't actually think about having to name it. Some quirks normally don't have names if the user doesn't really feel the need for a unique name. However Izuku did think of a name. Unholy Flames. I want to call it Unholy Flames. Endeavor actually gained a smirk. To him the name was actually perfect. And it amused him that it was close to his quirk's name. Inko however had a bit of a frown. The name sounded not as heroic as she would hope her son who dreamed of being a hero would name it. That's kind of too close to the truth Izu. I don't think a dark sounding name is good for a hero. They are really dark flames that feel chaotic. He then pointed at Endeavor. Sensei's quirk is called Hellflame too. Inko didn't have anything to dispute those points, especially not against Endeavor naming his own quirk the way he had. I guess you can name it that. She sighed. Let's get to training your unholy flames Midori. Endeavor said. Yes Sensei Izuku nodded and got ready to train his dark fire. Fayumi didn't know if what she was doing was necessarily a good idea. But she opened the door to her father's study. It was late that evening and the Midoriyas had left for their own home and she had a question that wouldn't leave her mind. She had to know why her father was doing this more specifically, training Izuku. She believed that it was because of his fire but also felt like there was more to it, a reason that she wasn't sure if her father was even aware of. The flaming man didn't look up from his papers he was looking at but did acknowledge her. Fayumi, dad the woman didn't really know how to state the question. Are you as Midoriya? Endeavor actually looked up at this point. Izuku's name being mentioned, pulling all of his attention. What about the boy? Fayumi took a breath because she really didn't know how to actually word the question. Instead all she could say properly was a request. Please don't make him end up like Shoto. The flaming man didn't reply for a second. He looked back at his papers. I was too busy worrying about him ending up like someone else. The man ended his part of the conversation there. Fayumi understood completely who he meant and nodded as she left without another word. Endeavor exhaled a breath of his own, unsure of what the future holds not knowing he was training the one who would become known to the world as the unholy hero. A few days after his mother's return from the hospital was Izuku's first day going back to school, having gained decent enough control that he could prevent any random outburst of flames. Even though the flames have never turned on to their own accord it was still something they thought best to be careful of. His powers were now registered as a quirk, even if they were actually in truth not. Izuku was nervous on his way to school because of his powers and them being registered as a quirk, not even because they were actually from a cult that messed up a ritual and became attached to Izuku, but because it would now be known by the school that he actually had a quirk. He didn't know if he could handle the attention, or if he even wanted it. The boy had admittedly become less cheerful looking over the last two weeks because of the pain that came with his powers and it also affected his mood overall. It would feel exhausting probably to have to keep up with everyone socially while also working on his training with Endeavor and his school work. Not really paying attention like he normally would Izuku kind of just entered his first class and was sitting in his seat before his mind caught up from its wandering off and he noticed his teacher looking at him. I said welcome back Midoriya. The aged woman repeated herself, not looking as annoyed as she would normally have been with Izuku when something happened at all and he was involved. Would you like to share your news with the class? What news? A kid with rock-like skin asked. Did the loser actually get a quirk? The kid and a few others snickered at that comment. Izuku didn't answer immediately so his teacher did. In fact, Midoriya did. The kids who all had just laughed swapped to surprised expressions. Really? The rock kid asked. What is it? Another student. A guy who had USB ports and parts as fingertips asked. The emerald kid actually answered for himself before the teacher could. It's called unholy flames. That sounds badass. The rock kid commented. Language Ericu the teacher scolded. Can we see it? The girl with water for hair asked, I don't think I should. Izuku didn't actually want to use the flames right then because he hasn't used it in front of anyone past his mother, Fayumi and Endeavor. Out of those three he only truly felt comfortable with it around Endeavor since the man himself could use his own fire-based quirk to shield himself. He mostly only used it around Endeavor and the man was more resistant to flames than anyone else. 
and even the man sometimes was wary of the raw power of Izuku's flames. If he lost control here he could potentially harm someone and Izuku didn't want the risk. Do not pressure Midoriya about his quirk in class, the teacher said to the students. I am sure he will show you all later. Before Izuku could even say anything again the teacher turned to the front. Open your textbooks to page 78. The Emerald Wielder of Fire sighed as he opened his textbook. He really didn't want to use his fire outside of training because of the pain. He had no doubt everyone will end up pressuring him later to see it and call him a liar about having a quirk if he doesn't, and treat him worse after that. A certain spiky, ash-blonde-haired teen narrowed their eyes at the emerald teen from their seat, wondering just what kind of flame quirk the previously quirkless loser had. For the rest of the school day Izuku was talked to a lot more than he was before. So many of the other kids all kept trying to ask him about his flames and attempt to talk him into using his quirk so they can actually see it. Izuku liked that for once he wasn't being bullied but it also didn't feel right to him now how flipped everyone was compared to when he was quirkless. It was also not helping that Izuku was in truth still quirkless, so it felt like a definite fake look of care and interest from the others, more so than it already was. When the kids were let outside to play and let loose their energy from being stuck in the classrooms a lot of the other kids were hoping to get Izuku to show them his fire. But the emerald kid had seemingly disappeared. Izuku actually had slipped away to circle the building to a spot he would hide it to avoid the others when they were especially rude to him. As much as he liked finally being one of the group something didn't feel right about how quickly everyone was suddenly nice to him. Did they really change their entire opinion on him based on his having a quirk when they haven't even seen it yet? It made Izuku feel worse when he remembered he truly didn't have a quirk still. The boy frowned as his pain felt worse for a second. It was something he hated that he couldn't stop it at least get used to. After close to two whole weeks of having the supernatural powers and the pain with it he would have hoped that the pain would be something he would be numb to from it always happened if not just the pain being gone completely. Instead the pain seemingly stayed just as painful as a minimum as it was from the beginning. With the pain being so persistent and seemingly souring every moment for Izuku he really wasn't wanting any attention on himself by any of the others, so that they wouldn't notice he was in pain and assume he was being a crybaby or something like that, which was something that admittedly he was up until recently. He would have preferred no one even acknowledging his return to school so he could just silently deal with the pain until he found a way to just get rid of it once and for all. However everyone was giving him their undivided attention because they wanted to see his quirk. Izuku didn't want to make his pain worse and show the fire, because he knew he couldn't just show it for a second and be done with it. The others would want more than that. They would want something like seeing any moves he has, even though he has no moves right now because he is still trying to control it. Was he just overthinking this? It felt like he could just be making a big deal out of nothing. It wouldn't be surprising to Izuku if he was just paranoid about his fire because of his teacher endeavors saying to keep the truth hidden about his power's origin. Maybe he can just show them it and not care about anything afterwards. He stood up from his spot, settling the mental debate on the thought that he was just being paranoid. When Izuku got to the area where everyone else was at it took a second for the other kids to actually notice Izuku, showing that they weren't as over the top as Izuku was thinking. Hey Midoriya are you gonna show us your quirk now? A kid with sharp fingers for a quirk asked. The emerald teen nodded and pulled up his arm, rolling up his sleeve in the process. He knew he had to keep things under wraps but he also didn't have anything to conceal his bracers yet, so he had to roll his sleeve up to avoid burning the uniform and taking away his only current cover for the cursed objects. I am. It feels weird to do at this point so I try not to do it too much. He wanted to get that excuse out there to reason why he will try to only show it this one time. What's that? A kid pointed at the bracer. A special cast. Izuku quickly used the perplane lie. I burnt my arm so I have to wear this for now to help with my flames. Like how I had to wear special gloves on my fingers when they first started getting sharp. The one kid moved his mentioned fingers as he spoke. I guess. Izuku focused on his fire and tried to use as little as he could to show he did in fact have fire. His bracer ignited and began to send out a stream of flames into the air above the children. Well he really does have fire Arakui gaped. It's hot. A girl said as she felt the heat from where she was standing just a meter away from Izuku. It's fire dummy. A kid with reflective skin much like glass replied like the girl was stupid. I know that the girl huffed. Izuku took a breath as he stopped the stream of fire and lowered his arms. The pain was also not as bad as he was worried it would be. He was definitely believing now that he was just being paranoid earlier. That sucks. A kid said, getting everyone's attention. The kid had ash blonde, spiky hair and crimson eyes. He had a slight scowl at Izuku. It was Katsuki Bakugo, someone who at one point was a friend of Izuku's before Katsuki had gotten his own quirk and everyone's praise of it had gone to his head. After all that time you get a weak quirk like that. Izuku frowned. As much as he wanted people to not pay too much attention to his powers he also didn't want people to badmouth them. However it was Katsuki and he was honestly kind of a jerk so Izuku didn't respond to it. 
He just rubbed his elbow through his sleeve because it felt just a bit more numb from the fire. He didn't want to actively get attention right now and reacting to Beck Hugo would just inevitably end up in conflict. Katsuki gained a prideful look. This is an actually good quirk. He then showed his own quirk. Explosion. The ability to create explosions in his hands from the nitroglycerin that is in his sweat. He popped off a few explosions to rub what he believes to be the best quirk in Izuku's face. Not wanting the Emerald Kid to get a big head since he just gained his quirk. Katsuki will always have the better quirk and be number one. And he had to make sure people will remember that. Izuku still didn't respond, feeling like the situation would just continue with Katsuki's pride. Plus Katsuki was right. He had a better quirk than Izuku, but that was mainly true because Izuku didn't have a quirk. If Izuku were honest he would think his flames were better because of their intensity. And the fact of Endeavor himself, the most known and powerful flame using Pro Hero, had spoken highly of Izuku's flames. However he couldn't bring up any of that, so as it is Katsuki definitely one quirk wise. Katsuki had a smug look when Izuku didn't even try to argue or be stupid and act like he even compared to Katsuki. Even if he finally got a quirk the loser was still a loser. It saved time for Katsuki knowing he wouldn't have to remind Izuku of that. Izuku saw everyone had their attention on Katsuki and took that as a chance to leave the group, his arms starting to get to him again. Endeavor looked at the text again with no clue what language it was written in. He was trying to look in the book that had been taken from the worshippers of Leviat for anything that might be helpful to his student Izuku and hit a wall in the process. He had only recently begun with this process, something he now believes he should have been doing since day one, and was finding out how annoying it was to not understand a single word of text in an ancient book that had been half-burnt, admittedly by Endeavor himself. The book looked to be in some western language. That much was clear. Perhaps he should take the book and do research at a library. Someone there could easily just say what language it was and give him a translation or book for that. That seemed like the best thing to do at this point so Endeavor got up, grabbed the annoying half-burnt text and made for a library. On the way out of his house Endeavor walked across his youngest son, Shoto Todoroki. Shoto had long hair, though it doesn't pass his neck, and it was evenly split between two colors, white on his right side and crimson red on his left. Shoto had heterochromia iridium, which made his left eye's iris to appear turquoise, while his right is a dark gray. The teen had a decently sized burn scar on the left side of his face, which reaches from his hairline to halfway down his cheek. On top of this the ten-year-old had a glare at his father as he saw him. Shoto, the flaming man said in acknowledgement as he walked right past his son. The kid looked confused instead of angry now, not sure why his father just went right past him like that. As much as he hated his father and enjoyed how in the past two weeks his father has seemingly just stopped all of his efforts in pushing Shoto to take his damn goal that the boy didn't want. He hasn't even heard his father's line he would have said at the least four times a day about Shoto needing to use his fire anymore. He actually was confused why his father had seemingly just stopped caring about pushing Shoto and wondered what the man's time has went to now. Endeavor flipped open the book to show the librarian, who had become silent since seeing Endeavor of all people enter the library. It took every bit of her to actually want to ask the man if he could extinguish the flames he normally had active on his face, fire powers not really being a thing that were allowed in the library if it could be helped. Endeavor complied immediately, wanting to get answers on the book more important than his fire in the moment. Can you tell me what language this is in? The flaming hero asked again. The small, aged woman nodded as she took a look. After a minute she answered. It seems to be Latin. She decided to not question why the book was burned at all. Latin, Endeavor repeated. He didn't know Latin at all. He tried to think of if he knew a single thing by chance and didn't. A sound of irritation came from him as he realized he would probably have to learn Latin on his own to translate it. He couldn't let anyone else actually have the book who didn't know about it in Izuku's situation and only a handful of people knew and could be trusted. Perhaps he should ask the people who knew this situation if they happened to know the ancient language. Izuku was relieved when school finally let out that day. His pain had gone back down to its normal level and now he can go to his sensei's house and train more. The sooner he gets the best control he possibly could the sooner the pain can stop and that was a great incentive to Izuku. When he knocked on the door to the estate of his sensei he waited for not even a full minute before someone opened the door. Someone who wasn't his sensei but instead Izuku's age and slightly taller than him with hair that was half white and half red. Hello, Izuku said immediately. I am Izuku Midoriya. Is sensei home right now? The other kid just gave a look of confusion at that. Your sensei. Izuku was kind of glad his pain was not at a level to make him feel aggravated in any way and make him give a sour tone. He nodded and spoke again. Yes, Endeavor Sensei. The dual-hair-colored kid looked confused for all of a second before making a barely visible look of anger. But before he could do anything else someone spoke. Hi Midori Afayumi said happily to the emerald boy from behind her younger brother. The female Todoroki opening the door all the way to welcome Izuku into the home. Father should be in his study. 
Would you like tea before you train? Izuku shook his head. Thank you for the offer but I just want to train. This is my brother Shoto by the way. Fayumi saw her chance to introduce the two kids to each other properly. Shoto this is Izuku Midoriya. Shoto looked at Izuku for all of a single second with a glare before he walked off without a word. Izuku didn't even question it and instead walked away towards where he know Endeavor's study was. Fayumi just sighed in response to the poor meeting of the two kids she was hoping would be friends. Not knowing of the rivalry that had just started, Endeavor had gotten back to his home right at the same time as Inko Midoriya had actually showed up. The small emerald woman actually had gotten startled as the flaming man made his presence known. Over the past week her nature had just become something Endeavor didn't question, especially since he already knew it in part from Izuku. The boy had that same nervousness when he first met the kid. Even if now the kid seemed to be losing his nervousness in exchange for being uneasy and seemingly in an irritated mood from the pain the kid always experienced, Endeavor and Co. half exclaimed as she saw the man. She was there to help with her son in any way she could. Being one of the few who knew about the situation she was always in the loop over what happens in the development of Izuku's supernatural flames. Midoriya, the flaming man greeted her as he opened the door. Wait, who is watching Izuku right now? Inko thought the man was with Izuku who was coming to train right after school. If he has already arrived then he could be training on his own as we speak. Endeavor was sure Fayumi could have let Izuku into the house. What if he was found by one of those people? Inko asked with worry, which wasn't surprising to Endeavor. However he was. Now also considering the fact that Izuku could be found out by the worshippers of Leviat at a time that no one could keep the kid out of their clutches. However, how can they keep a secure watch on Izuku without raising concern over why a kid they want to make seem unseeming has a protection squad? Endeavor shook his head after a thought. Most of those cultists were arrested and separated so the chance that any of them even know this has happened and in a position to do anything is next to none. I believe that there shouldn't be any concern over Midoriya past his fire and his training of it. That's relieving. The woman commented. Speaking of Midoriya's fire, his current level is something of a problem. Any progress seems to have just stopped. Endeavor said as they walked through the house, both of them not noticing Shoto in a hull off their path, who gained a look of anger hearing the subject. Shoto just glared in the direction of his father and that woman. He at first upon seeing the emerald teen Izuku wanted to scoff about the kid being a student of his father. Endeavor was an asshole and there was no way he would teach anyone, especially someone who would somehow want to train. With him, hearing the man actually say it himself had made Shoto mad. Sure the kid hated his father and wanted nothing to do with the man. But it was something that rubbed him wrong that his father had actually gone and just replaced him as a student with a different kid. Shoto had the goal of shoving it to his father by surpassing him with just his right side. But now he also felt like proving that he can surpass this Izuku Midoriya as well. When Endeavor and Inko both entered the training room Izuku was in the middle of channeling his fire and trying to get it to go forward past his arms, trying to just get it to go just a bit beyond his fingers to no success. He didn't know why he couldn't move the fire and it irritated him that he had no clue how to advance. Midoriya, Endeavor said to get his students' attention. I see you starting training already. The Emerald Kid cancelled his fire, the dark flames disappearing and the sting lowering. I have made no new progress in Devor Sensei. Izuku reported with a disappointed sigh, closer to a grunt of frustration. I see. Wait till your breathing steadies and try again. Endeavor said as he planned to watch closely for what could be the issue. Izuku nodded and took a deep breath before he tried to grasp his fire like he was told in the beginning and ignite his fire. That part of the process worked alright but once Izuku tried to actually move the fire he came. Upon the wall again. He was picturing himself tapping that power and willing it forward like he was pushing that orb he pictured the fire to be but it just didn't do anything. The fire would grow in intensity but it wouldn't actually move forward like he was trying to move it. After a few seconds of no progress Izuku stopped and extinguished his flames. Endeavor was actually at a loss for what was wrong with the process for Izuku. The boy certainly was putting an effort and trying his hardest and the flames didn't seem to follow on that. He had a scrunched up expression as he tried to think through the possibilities. Izu, how do you try to use the fire? Inko asked, with her own expression of thought. I, um, picture it like it is something in front of me that I can touch and manipulate. So you push the flames Inko's mind wandered as she actually remembered the trick to someone's fire quirk that she heard them use in the past. Even if every memory of them is soured by the last few she remembered. This and believed it would be helpful to at least try. Izu, instead of picturing the flames as an outside force you can touch and hold to use try picturing it as something that is inside of you. Don't try to push the flames but guide them. The emerald fire user nodded and went through that new process. It felt different to actually picture the flames as part of himself and even the buildup of the flames felt slightly different, less chaotic. He held up his arms out from himself and flowed the sensation of the fire with a breath and hoped for results. And results were what he got. 
The fire shot forward like a rocket past both of his arms in twin fires and crashed into the wall with a booming sound and with enough force that it shook the room and possibly the entire house. The force of the fiery shot had actually knocked Izuku off of his feet and onto his back with a bewildered look while Endeavor had made sure to have his own flames active in case he had to block them for Inko. Endeavor had a shocked expression as he processed the firepower he just saw being used. Sure he had already known that the boy had fire that was for sure at least on Endeavor's own level. But the sudden change from not being able to move the flames to taking in one tip and launching fires that powerful was just surprising to say the least. Izuku didn't even care about the increased pain in his arms as much as he finally made more progress on his fire, jumping up excitedly to look at his mother and sensei. I made a fire. Inko actually clapped for her son. That was amazing she then immediately jumped to being a worried mother. Are you okay? Did you get hurt at all? Nope I'm okay Izuku smiled as he did his best to ignore the pain, which in that one moment was actually easier than usual. Endeavor grinned. Okay Midoriya, we have a new goal. Those fires must have been high powered and you overshot your fire on the first try. We shall go with the lesson from your mother and build up your control in this way till you can make that fire again but with proper control. Got it Izuku nodded as he decided to practice his new way of using his fire. Later Izuku had taken to just lying on the floor catching his breath with a water bottle while Endeavor and Inko were both talking. Miss Midoriya may I ask where that idea came from? The flaming man asked the small emerald woman. Do you have a fire quirk yourself? No I actually pull small objects to myself. Inko showed her quirk by making her purse float up to her hand. I just she made sure Izuku was not paying attention to them, which he wasn't as the boy was catching his breath after working on his fire for the last hour. Used to be married to a man with a flame quirk. That was how he used his own fire. Endeavor mentally questioned why Inko was being secretive about that fact and the woman answered it without his asking. I don't like to bring up or think about him. It did not end well and that was even before Izuku was born. Izuku doesn't actually know the man and I don't want him to know that horrible man. Inko explained. Endeavor looked at Izuku for a second. The kid had his arms up above him while on the ground with a small amount of his fire ignited. Something about knowing Izuku's situation with his own father stirred something in Endeavor's mind but he didn't know at this point what it was. Midoriya is a good student. At this rate I believe it will just be a few months before he has adept control. That's great. Inko thought for a second. Do you think he could be a hero with that power? She wasn't sure if Izuku can follow his old dream of being a hero with what was evil fire gained from a cult messing up a demonic ritual. I don't see why he couldn't. As long as the truth is hidden people shouldn't gain any wrong idea based on the truth and wrongly accuse him of being a villain. Is there any way of knowing more about his fire and those metal bands? I believe anything we would need to know is in here. Endeavor started as he pulled out the burnt book of Leviat's cult. It is burnt and missing a good portion, which is my fault, but any information should be beneficiary here. It's in Latin however and I do not know Latin. I actually know a bit of Latin. Inko stated, I don't know it word for word but I can translate a bit and can get back into learning it. At that point the flaming man offered the damaged book to Inko and she took it and opened it to take a look. She had a hard look as she attempted to use her limited knowledge to understand the text. Half of the text is too damaged to understand what it is saying. She stated after a minute, it was damaged during the arrest of the cultists. Endeavor reported, had he known that the book would be something he would have ended up needing he would have made sure to not damage it as much as he had. Is it possible that there is another book? Inko looked up at the man. They could have made a copy for safety. Endeavor blinked. He didn't know why he hasn't thought of that yet. It is a possibility. I can make sure to find out. I probably should. Begin to look into these people to gather information on Izuku's situation. I'm ready to go again Izuku announced as he got back up. Before he gripped his left forearm from the pain that flared. Then let's get back to it. Endeavor stood up. We can work on your control to lessen the pain and Miss Midoriya can see if the book has a way as well. Both adults didn't like to see the pain Izuku kept having to deal with and were definitely going to put full effort into finding ways to lessen it. Izuku jumped up in a cold sweat that night, breathing hard as he woke up. He stayed on the edge of his embed as he thought about what he dreamt about. It wasn't a regular dream at all. In fact it felt like it was a legitimate experience. What he experienced was seeing himself sit at a table. The lighting around it so poorly dim that he barely saw last his own hands. In this dream he couldn't, or wouldn't stand up. The only thing he could do was look ahead to the only source of light in the area. In his dream, at the other end of the table, sat a chair just like his. He couldn't see who sat it in, but he knew someone was there. He could see their body through the flames. Those dark, red flames that were of sinister origins. Those flames burned at the person, at the chair. The fire didn't spread away from that chair and the person sitting there. And the person didn't move or react to the flames at all. In fact Izuku was sure they did nothing at all while the flames bathed the man in their intense heat. The only indication Izuku had that the person was alive was that he could hear the beating of their heart, echoing across the dark room the two share. After waking up, 
Izuku thought about what that dream was supposed to mean, and after a few moments of thinking he came to one conclusion. What he saw was Levy at himself. Six months later, a blast of dark red flames crashed into a wooden target and made a kick of force that knocked the target back a few meters as it began to burn from the attack. The emerald-haired boy held his fist in front of him that had launched the fiery attack. Embers of the dark fire still floating around his arm and the ashen metal bracer that covered it. Your control has improved, a towering flaming man said. I believe that the fire is almost as high in skill as you can have it. Now all you have to do is know when to change the temperature and when to make it more of a concussive blast or a fiery one. Right. The fire-wielding kid nodded as he ignored the pain his arms felt. Endeavor Sensei I think I am done today. That is best. I have to leave for the investigation anyways Midoriya. Endeavor stated as he put his hand on the boy's shoulder. Take it easy today and tomorrow. I will be back the day after with hopefully good news and information. Endeavor had not gotten anything useful from the cult six months prior when he tried to inquire about more books, none of them wanting to give their holy text to a so-called heathen. Luckily one of the non-arrested members was caught recently in a robbery just days earlier, and they got info about a possible location of more of the cult that were also partaking in illegal activities. However that sect was located in Italy, and it took a day for Endeavor to actually get the proper licensing and papers together to allow him to act as a temporary pro-hero in Italy to actually be able to go investigate more information on Izuku's cursed powers. The Emerald Kid nodded. I won't overdo it while you are gone. I trust that, Endeavor said as the two then made their way to leave the training room. When I return I think we'll work on that move of yours. Izuku had a small smile at the idea of beginning to properly train to use his super move. I'm not sure I can wait to be honest. I understand, but remember to not use it yet without proper practice. That requires a hard control level and has a backlash. The man lectured and his student nodded again, making his teacher grin. Now return to your mother. I imagine she wants you home right now. Izuku nodded again, his natural neutral expression prevalent in his face, the pain returning and making his rare smile disappear. See you after the investigation, sensei. He got a gruff sound as a response from the flaming man before the kid was gone. Endeavor grabbed his coat and put it on before grabbing a suitcase with his work gear and other necessities inside before leaving as well. He was hoping this trip would actually bear results in their favor, especially Izuku's. Endeavor himself might not be one for anything of the emotional type but even he was aware of his student's personality having changed since gaining the powers that he possessed. Izuku smiled less and less and that overly enthusiastic energy the boy had when they began the training had eroded over time and was replaced with a more calm and neutral energy. It wasn't bad with just that but the boy didn't seem to be as happy as he used to appear and it was definitely due to his powers that caused pain for him constantly. It couldn't really be blamed on the kid for his now natural edged mood considering that. On his way out he had seen his daughter Fayumi and bid her farewell but hadn't seen or even looked for his son Shoto. Even if Endeavor had remembered in that moment to even interact with Shoto the boy wouldn't want to interact with his father anyway. A bit later Izuku had arrived home quietly, removed his shoes before speaking. Mom, I'm home. Izuku said just loud enough for her to hear if she was in the living room or kitchen. Izuku got no response so he spoke again, just a bit louder. Mom, Izuku still got no response so he looked around to see no sign of his mom at first glance. Mom, the emerald boy said again just in case as he checked the fridge just in case she left a note for groceries, which he saw a note meant for him from this morning he must have missed. Izu please get some vegetables on the way home from training today mom. Izuku didn't see any other note and guessed his mother either was getting the vegetables herself or was still at work. In either case he should still go get the vegetables just to be safe so he made his way back to the front door to get his shoes and leave. He figured his mom would be home by the time he got home also. Endeavor was about to enter the airport right as he heard someone familiar call out his name, specifically his actual name. Had it been his hero name he admittedly would have most likely ignored it but his real name was used and that meant it was someone who knew him personally enough that he wouldn't mind them using it. And that was a small list. Todoroki the voice belonged to Inko Midori. The small emerald woman seemed exhausted like she had rushed down to the airport to catch him before his flight. People actively looked confused at hearing someone actually be bold to speak to the flaming man who always seemed unpleasant. They got even more confused when he responded in a not rude fashion. Midoriya and Ji Todoroki voiced his own confusion. He let her get closer, closing a bit of the gap himself, before speaking again. What are you doing here? I had to tell you the small woman was out of breath and red-faced from running. Not in shape enough to have rushed there as quick as she did without consequences on her energy. I found something new. She opened her purse and held up the damaged book that related to her son's cursed flames. Endeavor immediately spoke in a hushed tone. Not here. He then moved towards a more secluded spot to avoid any persons who couldn't mind their own business. Once he found a spot he turned to the woman who had followed and had regained more of her breath. 
Why couldn't you call or message this? I forgot my phone at work and thought you should know this before you left. Inko explained as she opened the book towards three quarters of the way to the back. What was found? Endeavor's attention was definitely pulled all to the book now. Did a piece of text reveal anything? The emerald woman shook her head. It wasn't just that. I found a new page that was hidden because it was placed into another page. She pulled a unnoticeable small piece of a page and revealed a whole other page inside of it that was filled with new text. The flaming man gained wide eyes with fascination. What does this say? I only translated a small bit before I rushed here. I am really concerned about this part here on the back. She flipped the page over and revealed a drawing. It says that it is a power of his. A power. Endeavor didn't like how that implied there was more to Izuku's curse than just the fire. He looked at the drawing and saw the metal bracers that were fused to his pupil's forearms drawn in detail, but with something else to them. Dark tendrils from what it looked like they were coming from the bracers themselves, like extra limbs almost. Izuku grit his teeth as he felt his flare with intensity upon leaving the small store with a bag of vegetable. His expression turned sour as he used his open hand to grip his other arm through the jacket that hid his cursed additions to his arms. He didn't even care that it had started to rain slightly, not even noticing as his arms preoccupied him and pulled his attention to them. His focus being on his arms caused him to not notice a figure right as he walked in front of an alley that left the alley and crashed right into him and sent them both to the ground. Izuku grunted as he sat up and came face to face with a girl his age who was in horrible condition. She was in the plainest shirt and pants, which had rips and tears on them, with no shoes or anything to cover her feet or even provide warmth or protection against the rain that was starting. Her black hair was knotted and all over the place like it hasn't even once been brushed or taken care of at all. What caught Izuku off guard the most were her onyx eyes that held so much terror like she was completely horrified at that moment. The girl hadn't meant to knock into the green-haired teen at all. She hadn't even seen him as she was looking over her shoulder to make sure he wasn't still following her. The girl had meant to jump up and run again but stopped when she locked eyes with the other kid she had accidentally knocked over. For some reason his emerald eyes had pain in them just like hers and the confusion made her not get up and just continue running. The two kids didn't move for a second from their positions where they had fallen, both just looking at each other in confusion. Right as they both were going to react to the situation a voice got their attention. There you are Momo. An eerie and calm voice spoke as a man exited the same alley the girl had just left herself. I was worried you had gotten too far and lost your way. Izuku didn't look at the man immediately because the sheer terror that had grown in the Momo girl's eyes at just the man's voice and presence made him feel scared as well. The cold aura Izuku felt this man give off just by speaking made him think this was a man he shouldn't even consider crossing, despite not even knowing yet what the man looked like. Izuku finally looked at the man to see a man who appeared to be in his late twenties with short brown hair, golden eyes. He had an olive green bomber jacket with purple fur around the collar, black pants and dress shirt, white gloves and tie with plain shoes. His most noticeable clothing was a brown plague doctor-like mask with gold ornate tracing. HSI good eyes were locked onto both Momo and Izuku like he was studying the situation completely for every single detail. I am sorry my daughter caused you any trouble. The man looked at Izuku, his gold eyes lacking emotion in a way that made Izuku's hair stand on the back of his neck. He looked back at the girl, who had not moved at all, her gaze still on Izuku's eyes like she was afraid of even moving her sight. Momo, apologize to him and let's go on our way. The girl's eyes just pleaded for help in any way but at the same time looked defeated, like she knew there was nothing that could be done. Izuku didn't know properly what was going on between this girl and her father but his gut told him it was not good at all and that he shouldn't let Momo be anywhere near the man. Izuku stood up, his arms in more pain than usual not even being noticed by Izuku as he made his decision to be completely reckless and possibly make the dumbest decision he would ever make. You heard her, he said quietly as his arms finally registered as being in a lot of pain at that moment. He felt that she had a lot more pain than him and Izuku didn't like that at all. His pain was something unbearable to him so he didn't like the idea of this girl or anyone, going through anything close to that. The girl looked terrified for Izuku at that moment. She barely got out a quiet warning. Don't. She didn't want someone else to die because of her again. She didn't want her father to unleash his wrath on another poor unknowing person, especially a kid like this boy that looked like he already had his own pain. The man narrowed his eyes at the emerald boy. I have no idea what you are. An unknown rage flared in Izuku. A dark rage that just made him mad at the man for what he knew was a lie. Liar. The man calmly took a breath and began to take off a glove. Kid, I will give you one chance to leave this situation out of your concern and continue living. The man didn't want or have the time to deal with some brat who didn't know how out of the league this man was to him. The cursed boy looked at Momo for all of a second before he confirmed his decision. He wasn't going to let someone else be in pain at all if he could help it. He will use his cursed fire to protect anyone else in pain and use his own pain to fuel that goal. Izuku quickly grabbed Momo's arm and pulled her behind him, shocking both the man and girl. 
He looked at the man defiantly as his evil fire began to flare up under his jacket. The man took off his gloves completely. So you have chosen death. I won't let you hurt her Izuku declared as he raised his arms and shot out his flames. As Izuku's dark flames rushed towards the masked man he calmly planted his hand swiftly on the wall of a building next to him and suddenly the wall surged forward and made itself be in front of the man, blocking the fire from having any effect on him. Boy you are out of your league. The man made the wall move again after the blasts were gone and made the wall break into spikes that weren't going at Izuku yet. I offer this one last chance out of kindness. The man was actually planning on making Izuku lower his guard. Izuku's fierce look didn't waver at all. He quickly assessed that the man had a quirk based on touch, and seeing the wall be manipulated how it was made Izuku assume the man could just make any object he touched bend shape like that. He wasn't sure if the man could do that to Izuku if he got his hands on him but Izuku wasn't going to try to find out. Izuku made his fire get ready to go off again. I doubt you are capable of it. The man scowled and Momo tugged Izuku's shoulder just enough to get his attention. Please don't. Izuku gave her a reassuring look. Don't worry, I got this. Don't take your eyes off the threat. The man spoke as he made the spikes rush at Izuku finally. The flame-wielding teen was ready and released powerful blasts of his flames that melted or broke the spikes away from him. I didn't forget you. The flaming teen shouted as he threw two more blasts at the man, who used his quirk to block them again. The man scowled at Izuku's defiance. You are only delaying your death. He made a single fast-moving spike of the wall shoot faster than Izuku was prepared for. The emerald fire user only had enough time to push Momo away, accidentally throwing her farther than he meant with his enhanced strength, before it shot right through his left bicep and straight out of the other side of his arm. The cursed child hissed in pain as he quickly grabbed the spike with his free hand and pulled himself off of it. He quickly fired a stream of flames at the man to buy a moment to make a plan. Izuku needed space to work but had to also protect Momo so he had to make a quick change of the situation, especially with his now injured arm. Izuku didn't think staying in his spot would be a smart play here, and he couldn't let the girl stay near danger either. He would have to actively move since he didn't know the extent of this man's quirk, and he couldn't risk more needless injuries. Momo don't let go. What the girl looked confused before Izuku, moving incredibly fast, ran up to her and scooped the girl into his arms and began running away from the man. He ran down the alley to avoid the public and involving them in the mess while he was still in sight of the man. The man glared at the fleeing boy and cursed. He couldn't let the damned brat take away his daughter just like that. He needed her quirk and wasn't about to let it go. He knelt down to grab the ground and activated his quirk, quickly manipulating the pavement to make it move forward and pursue the kids. Not soon after, the man caught up and attempted to grab at the running mid, who felt his instincts tell him to dodge. Izuku jumped to the side harder than he meant to, not used to using his heightened physique completely. He almost slammed himself into the wall of a building but used his foot to kick off and keep moving forward. The man changed how he used his quirk and made the ground in front of Izuku sharply rise up, making the kid have to stop before he would run face first into it. Izuku turned and faced the man, realizing the man had effectively cornered him. He quickly looked around and saw a fire escape, and jumped with all his might towards the ladder of it, right as his feet connected with the metal. Izuku used the same amount of force to kick off and jump higher, effectively launching himself over the wall that had locked him in the area. The entire time Izuku was running, Momo had an expression of shock which became awe as the other kid jumped over the wall and was all that much closer to getting away from her father. The man had a calm expression however as Izuku jumped through the air. He changed the use of his quirk and a spike jetted out of the wall and shot up, impaling Izuku's foot and making the teen drop Momo as his body twisted from the attack. Izuku's ankle snapped, his momentum from jumping going against him as his foot became impaled and made him spin on the cement. He thankfully wasn't caught completely on the spike and fell to the ground as well, crashing with a thud into the pavement of the alley on the other side of the wall from where he jumped. The mask-wearing man walked through the wall, manipulating it to open a path for him. He looked at his daughter and this other brat, both not yet being able to get up from falling from the height they did. Your pathetic attempt at interfering is over. The man reached for Izuku with his hand. The flame-wielding teen showed surprising agility and spun on the ground to slam his unbroken foot into the man's forearm and follow it up aiming his right arm at the man and shooting a stream of flames at the man that made the man back up. I'm not down yet. The kid quickly moved to a kneeling position aimed at the man and held up his arms to prepare to throw more streams of fire if he needed to. He needed to actually get out of there now, given the state of his foot and his arm. He saw out of the side of his eye that Momo was beginning to get up herself, and thought about how it was more important to get her out of here instead of worrying about his wounds. His curse made the pain just tolerable enough that he could handle it for a few more minutes and he needed to make sure that time was used to build distance between this girl and her father. Momo, the kid turned to look at her. Run, get out of here. The girl looked at him for all of a second with her expression of being scared, 
before picking herself up and running quickly the opposite way and out of the alley. Izuku almost felt a smile as he turned back to face the man, who had somehow undone the damage of the flames to his arm. Damn you. The man cursed Izuku and the child responded by making his fire build up, shooting two massive streams of flames at the masked man. The man grabbed the wall that he was next to and made it block the fire as well as also spike out at Izuku twice as much as he had made any before. Izuku didn't have many spots to actually move around to him that would block the spikes, or easy mobility anyways thanks to his broken ankle, but got a plan based on something he had planned to work on down the road. Izuku made a burst of flames fire out from his bracers as he thrust his arms down, the force causing Izuku to blast up through the air as he dodged the spikes that all ended up colliding where he had just been standing. The fiery teen kept his scowl as he quickly moved his arms to point at the man while he was still a good 8 meters in the air and used his one named move he had, even if it wasn't completely developed, ignoring the warnings he had been given. Izuku's dark flames erupted from his bracers over the top of his forearms and began to spin and spiral in a spiraling motion as the fast-moving collection of twin S of fire shot off like cannons at the man. Spiraling hell shot. The teen shouted his undeveloped attack's name as the blasts hit the man who didn't have much time to react completely. The two attacks crashed with force into the half-made dome the masked man was attempting to make to shield himself with, exploding with intense heat and force. The man was blasted backwards farther into the alley and Izuku was sent back as well, the recoil launching him farther into the air as he was set across the street into a separate alley where he crashed back first, not able to react due to his arm's pain increasing dramatically. The use of his attack tore at multiple parts of his muscles along his forearms and his arms overall, and the force of the blast had worsened his wound on his left bicep. Izuku coughed as he quickly got up as much as he can, forcing the pain from his mind as best he could as he stared across the street to see the man also getting up himself. The man had lost his mask during the attack and his jacket was half burned away, intense burns covering his right arm and upper as the man breathed heavily. Instead of panicking like a normal person he used his left hand to tap his and the man's body seemingly vibrated and was almost instantly back to perfect condition, minus the missing parts of his outfit. The man gave Izuku an almost crazed look from his spot across the street. You do, you damned filth. He grabbed the ground in a swift motion and suddenly the ground shook in what seemed like a violent earthquake as multiple spikes erupted from the ground and created a wall of moving death towards Izuku. The teen felt panic for a second as he blasted fire from his one uninjured arm at the ground in an attempt to launch himself back through the air, to no success. He was screwed against this man. The guy could just undo any damage done to himself from Izuku's flames and keep going. Meanwhile Izuku had used his spiraling hell shot twice, which was past his limit, plus the use of his attack had damaged his wounded arm even more. Izuku wasn't in fighting condition at all anymore. It was too weak. As a spike he couldn't dodge impaled Izuku through his side the cursed teen only felt anger at himself for not being enough to stop this man. He was useless. This makes it more complicated if more powers are hidden away in those bracers. Enji remarked as it sunk in for him and Enko that their situation might not be anywhere near simple or as simple as it can be when they had to watch over a child who was cursed by a cult. Isn't it possible that Izu might only have the one I don't think he could handle more? Inko didn't want to imagine Izuku getting more pain as a result from any new abilities popping up. I think though the flaming man got cut off as his work radio, something he always had on him as a habit, went off. There are reports of a villain attack on 78. High-powered dark flames are in the area so heat-resistant heroes are requesting. Enji froze. Not knowing anyone past his student that had flames that fit that description anywhere near Musutafu, he looked at the mother who was also realizing the possibility as well. I gotta go. The man quickly began to move to get to who he knew had to be his student. Izuku couldn't move anymore, the four spikes in him preventing much movement. There were two going through his torso, one in his left thigh and the last in his right bicep. Izuku's left arm was hanging limply, next to useless from his reckless use of his spiraling hell shot. The emerald kid was stuck standing upright from the spikes and his head had fallen forward, looking down in front of him weakly as he heard the man, or someone, approach him. I told you, you were out of your league, the man said as he readjusted his mask. As much as killing you right here would be something I would enjoy, I want you to suffer for a moment. Realize your mistake and your arrogance before you die. The man began to walk away. Now excuse me while I get my daughter back. Izuku struggled weakly, trying to lift his limp arm. He couldn't die here. He couldn't let that man get Momo. He couldn't let the last six months with Endeavor be for nothing. He couldn't just let others like Momo go through pain, or else there was no reason he was trying to become a hero with his curse. The Emerald Teen needed to be stronger, he had to get stronger and stop that pain. He forced himself to move as much as he could and a black mass began to leak from his bracers and wounds. Momo stopped running as she got around a corner, gasping hard as she tried to regain her breath. She couldn't believe what was happening. Someone was actually standing up to him. 
Her father, Kai, of all people, the man she only saw and still fear into others. Who was that kid why wasn't he afraid? No, he was afraid. She saw his eyes that looked like hers. He was also in pain and scared. So why was he standing up to Chisaki what made him different from her? She was weak. That was the difference. That's enough foolishness Momo. That voice made Momo feel despair as she turned and saw her father, the man having not a single scratch on him despite missing half of his shirt and his jacket long gone. The man had regained only his mask that was back on his face. He was there. That meant that the other kid was killed. The only person who has ever tried to stand up for her was gone. Momo's eyes began to well up as she saw no escape from her hell. You will be punished when we return home. Chisaki reached out his arm to grab her. Momo tried to step away, praying that she could get a miracle. Her prayer was answered. Get away from her. An angry emerald blur shouted as black tendrils grabbed and yanked Chisaki backwards towards the source of the tendrils, Izuku. The cursed kid didn't know what exactly the tendrils were but they seemed to follow his control, the things coming from his bracers. The masses were black and looked as if they had red veins on them. Izuku used his moment of having the masked man off guard to yank the guy to him and slam his fist into the man's face, actually cracking and knocking off the plague doctorsk mask. The man was thrown to the side before he struggled up and looked at Izuku with shock. How are you still alive? Izuku didn't know that himself either. His wounds were still there, he could feel them. But a black mass, much like the tendrils he had flowing from his bracers, were in, on his wounds like they were filling in the spots. If he had to guess it must be an ability he had that was like an adrenaline rush or second wind for emergencies. He however figured that his current state won't last and he would have to be careful until the fight was done. I won't let you near her, Izuku declared as he forced his flames to activate and flare to life. The man hated this kid a lot now, the brat getting in his way being something that made him want to tear the nuisance limb from limb. He tapped his hand against himself to heal his body again. I am going to make you regret involving yourself in this, boy. Izuku scowled as he got ready to attack. I will make you regret ever harming her. Momo looked at the emerald kid in awe, amazed by his will to keep going against Chisaki. Izuku attacked first, whipping his arm and making a tendril swing at the man, who grabbed it as it knocked him off of his feet. The tendril suddenly blew apart, all the way down to the bracer. Izuku felt like his arm was being stabbed and grit his teeth as he used another tendril on his other arm to swing at his opponent. Izuku now knew the man could manipulate living things like Izuku. If the tendrils were extensions of the bracer in him, the guy must be able to, so Izuku would have to stay extra careful with this man. The man scowled when his attempt to blow the kid apart didn't work. For some reason grabbing that black tendril only allowed him to manipulate it, his control not going past the pieces of metal on the boy's arms that he could now see since the kid's jacket had the sleeves burned off. Give up now boy. The man ordered as he grabbed another tendril and blew it up. Izuku wincing at the action. I far overpower you. Izuku needed a strategy. He couldn't just be stupid about fighting this guy. All of his injuries were piling up. And whatever this black stuff in his wounds was, it definitely wasn't going to last forever. He could tell it wasn't healing him as much as holding him together to keep him from dying. Izuku had to finish this before he couldn't use this black stuff anymore. I don't care. That is not wise. Accept your fate and stop fighting an unwinnable fight. The man replied. As long as you try to hurt her, I will use my curse to stop you. Momo run. Izuku forced his bracers to make multiple tendrils on each, numbering eight on both arms. Izuku felt immense pain just from the creation, telling him that this was beyond what was his limit, but he grit his teeth and used all sixteen to attack the man from multiple directions. Foolish, the man stated as he grabbed the ground and repeated his earlier move of making the area begin to erupt into a field of spikes that went at Izuku. Momo had only moved just enough to not be in the way of the fight before she had froze. Did he say he was cursed? Did someone else have a curse like her? No, he wasn't like her. He wasn't afraid of fighting this man. She was too scared to even run away anymore. The kid frowned as he had to stop his assault on the man and made the tendrils grab onto a fire escape above him and pull him off of the ground. Izuku made the tendrils disappear back into the bracers as he went through the air and summoned his fire that roared to life as he aimed at the man and made the fire begin to spiral around his arms before firing off two more shots of his move. Spiraling hell shot. Izuku yelled over his pain as he forced himself to ignore the torment he was putting his body through. Izuku managed to land in his feet and tried to make more fire, only for his arms to not respond at all, both of them hanging limply by his side. His arms were done. The black mass he had that was keeping his wounds from getting in the way were no longer on his arms, Izuku having used too much energy for it to stay. The man let out a weak groan as he regained awareness of himself after the direct hit from the fiery attacks. His upper body was covered in intense burns and he was barely able to stay conscious. How did he let that hit him? How did that that little bastard? Actually even get this close to beating him Chisaki moved his arm as best he could, which was an intense effort just to move the limb, and grabbed his side, using his quirk to fix his body back to perfection. He no longer had his jacket or even his shirt anymore, 
and his mask was missing during the fight, but he was now back to his full strength. He looked at the teen and saw the state the Emerald Kid was in. And now the inevitable has arrived. He stood up and flexed his hands. Just like Icarus you have gone further than you should have. Izuku felt panic as he tried to make his arms raise or at least create fire, which wasn't happening at the moment in either case. He had no fire or those new tendrils to combat this man, who was in perfect condition again. Izuku's only power that was active was the odd black mass that covered and filled his wounds to let him continue fighting. But even this second wind ability was at its limits. He didn't even have the black stuff on his arms anymore and it felt like the mass wasn't going to be on the rest of his body for much longer either. The man gained an arrogant smirk as he began to move towards Izuku. I will remember your last expression as one of fear. I'm not done yet. Izuku pulled himself together as he ran at the man at an angle. Cannot just die with a little grace. The man sighed as he got ready to grab at the emerald teen. Izuku sidestepped out of his previous path as he quickly jumped off of a cement spike made from the man's last attack and swung into a spinning motion and kicked the man in his jaw, getting past the man's guard thankfully. The emerald teen didn't waste time in putting space back between him and his opponent, knowing how dangerous it would be to stay within reach of the man. Right now Izuku's job was just to waste this man's time while Momo got far away. The man scowled as he fixed his cracked jaw back to normal. You are a nuisance, you brat. He didn't bother waiting for the kid to come at him again. He didn't have time for these games. Instead he knelt and grabbed the ground, repeating his most used attack here to make spikes of the ground erupt up. He knew the brat had lost a huge part of his mobility and wouldn't be able to dodge this time. Izuku felt stress as he did his best to avoid the spikes but it didn't take long for one to hit him, impaling his left calf and going straight through the limb. Izuku cried out in pain from the attack as he tried to steady himself and not make the wounds worse. The man stopped the attack after one more spike impaled the brat in his left shoulder. He stood up and began to move to finish the kid off. As much as I now despise you, I admit to having a certain level of respect, at your age somehow being more of a challenge than some of those so-called heroes. He stopped in front of the teen who had begun to breathe heavily. His black mass that was keeping him together this long beginning to lose shape and drop off of him like water. I must know your name. Mine is Kai Chizaki. He had no qualms with revealing his name to a kid he was about to kill. Izuku took a big breath, struggling to take in oxygen. He saw movement and was equally scared, worried and relieved. My name is, Concussion, Kai sighed. The brat was a kid after all, so much for respect. That is no. Just as Izuku said, the man definitely got a concussion, in the form of the girl Momo using a metal rod to swing at the back of his head. The scared girl stood defensively, holding the rod she had created tightly. I'm not letting you hurt him. Izuku was so glad that someone saved him but wished that Momo had used the chance to get as far away from them as she could. Momo go. No, the girl shook her head hard as she shouted. She couldn't even consider running away to leave the Emerald Kid to face her dad alone anymore. If he was cursed but not afraid then she could also lose her fear. I don't want to be afraid anymore. She ran over to the other kid and helped him off of the spikes he didn't have the strength to get off of himself. Izuku groaned as he fell over onto the ground, the spikes having been keeping him upright. He couldn't actually move much on his own anymore thanks to his wounds and his black mass wearing off. It's still too dangerous to be around that guy. My curse wasn't enough. Izuku coughed out his words. He needed to figure out how to use this power to reinvigorate the black mass into healing him more or else he wasn't going to last much longer, especially untreated. Momo put her arms against Izuku's to keep him from straining himself. I'm going to use my curse to help you. She focused on her quirk, her curse, and activated it. A pink and blue light show appeared around her arm and bandages ended sprouting from her flesh, except they were made out of the legitimate material and not her flesh. The girl began to try to cover his wounds the best she could with her limited medical experience. It was enough to amaze Izuku, who had an odd expression as he watched the girl trying to patch him up. He looked at the girl who had saved him, who somehow had a scared expression looking at him, avoiding eye contact like she was afraid of a reaction as she tried to cover his wounds. Momo was afraid by instinct. Her always being abused by Kai and being told that her quirk was a curse made her afraid on a deep level of using it even on the boy who had risked his life to get her away from her dad. Thank you. The emerald boy spoke. Thank you the girl was confused by the foreign statement for a second. I mean what else do I say when you probably saved my life by patching me up Izuku asked with his own confusion. He remembered Momo calling her quirk her own curse and despite the situation going on around them decided to deal with that. Your gift saved me. Thank you. Almost immediately Momo knocked over Izuku from the force of her hugging him tightly. The emerald boy caught off guard from the action. Something about the way he called her curse a gift and thanked her made Momo feel so happy. Thank you. Izuku was surprised by her reaction and guessed it had to be because of that Kai guy, which made him remember where they were. He didn't even care about the pain Momo unintentionally caused him by hugging him tightly we should get out of here. I won't let you make a fool out of me. 
Kai yelling venomously got the kid's attention. The man had gotten up and was glaring down at the two kids. He felt immense hatred for that fire-using brat, who had so far destroyed all of Kai's patience and even made his tool try to resist Kai's control. He was going to make that kid feel as much torment as possible before he ended the little bastard's life. Izuku and Momo both looked up in shock and terror as Kai made to grab the two, the small distance between him and them not allowing much of a chance to escape. The emerald teen acted on instinct and raised his right arm straight at the man and shot four tendrils out at full force that crashed into the man and kept going to crash him into the side of one of the buildings they were in between. Kai had destroyed two of Izuku's tendrils in the process. The kid cursed as his arm was racked with pain. He needed to quickly figure out how to access this power and heal his body or everything here was over. He looked at Momo for a second and saw the terror she held for her father and it triggered the growth he needed. It forced his anger at this man to spike and the negative emotions forced more of black mass to be generated and began to cover his wounds again. Momo we both have to either get away or take him down for good. The emerald boy quickly got up with newfound energy, the girl getting up just after him. As much as Momo was admittedly still terrified of Kai she had hope for once. Hope in this emerald boy who stood his ground against the man. Even despite the hope she also thought it would be best for them to run away. But that man can still follow them. I, I think we can take him down together Izuku made his dark flames flare to life on his bracers. Glad to have the cursed powers active again even if they brought him a pain of their own. I got close a few times but couldn't follow through because my powers weren't strong enough. Izuku doubted they could really get away from this guy. He wouldn't stay down for more than a minute. Who knows how fast he could chase them too. Their best bet was to either defeat this guy or stall till heroes inevitably showed up. And the latter had to be happening soon. The emerald boy gave Momo a confident look. You think you can do this he didn't want to force her into this fight with the guy, and would admittedly go with running as fast as he could with Momo if she couldn't fight. The girl looked at Kai, who was getting up from his spot against the wall Izuku threw him at with an angry expression, and then back at Izuku's emerald eyes. She saw the confidence in them and also something that threw her for a loop. Fear. He was afraid too was he actually afraid here of fighting Kai but ignoring it that made her feel better about her admittingly still being afraid despite her earlier declaration. She nodded. I can do it. How dare you take my daughter and use her against me? Kai spat as he began to grab the wall he was just thrown into and the building began to be manipulated into even more spikes. Can't you do any other moves Izuku threw any caution about his wrists of using his powers out of his mind as he pushed his fire to its limit, making the dark flames spin around his arms violently before he fired them off in his spiraling hellshot attack. The ensuing blast shook the alley as the flaming attacks went off like powerful explosions upon impact with what Izuku hoped was Kai. The recoil of the attacks had pushed Izuku backwards off of his feet as his arms burned intensely from the reckless attack. Izuku had actually broken his arms from the blast, showing what his full power does to his body at that point. Momo panicked momentarily. Are you okay? Izuku got back up, his black mass beginning to patch his arms up. Thanks to you he looked over to where the smoke was and where his opponent should be. Did I get him? Izuku got an answer in the shape of a spike shooting out of the smoke and going right through his shoulder before he could move away. Kai had a pissed off look as he walked out of the smoke, holding a chunk of the wall that had broken off. The man had scrapes all over his upper body but hadn't healed them yet. In actuality Izuku's attacks hit a quickly made wall that Kai used for protection, but the power of the attacks had broken through the impromptu wall and slammed Kai into the building again. He looked at the emerald kid. Every time I believe I couldn't hold any more disdain for you, you simply find a way to increase that limit. NNNNNGH. Izuku responded by trying to lift himself off of the spike. Before Kai grabbed the spike and manipulated it to make the section inside of Izuku's shoulder spike out into smaller spikes inside of him, tearing up and breaking his shoulder, rendering Izuku's right arm useless. Yeah. Momo tried to move to Izuku only for Kai to manipulate the chunk of cement in his hand to spike out and impale her in the side. She cried out in pain also from her wound. My tool will not help nuisances. Kai glared at Momo as he made the cement leave her side and returned to him, the girl falling over right after. He looked back at Izuku. None of this would have happened if you had minded your business. He made the cement inside of Izuku spike out farther into Izuku's shoulder, destroying the bone and making the kid yelp in pain. Izuku began to tear up from the pain as he tried to struggle off of the spike to no success. He couldn't lose. He had to keep trying and fighting until he won and Momo was safe. Izuku needed an opening and nothing was there for him. The boy decided to make a poor and reckless opening using his left arm that was still functional and made seven tendrils, a process that was almost noticeably painful compared to the destruction of his right shoulder, and made the black masses all rush Kai as fast as he could make them. Kai, who had been approaching Izuku to use his quirk on the boy, was caught off guard and once again sent into a wall by the tendrils, only blowing up one in the process. Izuku used his new small window and used his left arm, 
with two tendrils and punched the cement he was impaled on in an attempt to break it off. The first hit only cracked the cement and sent a vibration up the spike that caused a new wave of pain for Izuku's broken shoulder. The emerald boy went another way and made the tendrils in his left bracer, all four that he had out, break into the building behind him and grab hold onto the structure. Izuku took a breath as he made the tendrils pull him off of the spike with force, all of the small jagged parts tearing through his shoulder as he freed himself. The boy lost his tendrils as he lost focus and fell to his knees, the pain being too much as his shoulder took a toll on him, the Y mess with chunks of his flesh missing almost being too much to handle. Momo weakly got up from her spot hearing Izuku sobbing in pain. The shoulder scared her to actually see, even his bones as broken as they were, were actually visible. You're hurt. She didn't know what else to say. Izuku grit his teeth and looked up at the girl. You need to get out of here. You're hurt and I can use my powers to keep fighting. Momo shook her head and tried to help him stand. I'm not leaving without you. Izuku looked at the girl who had sincere concern for him despite her bleeding out from her side. It angered him that he wasn't doing better to help her. Damn it. He had to force his powers to overcome this villain. His negative emotions pulled more in the curse and spurred the black mass to work quicker, patching up his shoulder quicker than his previous wounds. If the rate of regeneration was anything to go by, he'd be healed within the day. I need to stop trying to have a final moment of triumph and just end you. Kai's voice announced his being back to continue the fight after Izuku put him through the wall. The man took note of the kids being back in good condition. He ran this time at the kids and Izuku reacted quickly, firing off a fiery blast and pushing Momo away before Kai used the cement in his hands and manipulated it into multiple spikes that shot at where Izuku was standing. No, the girl tried to get back at Kai with a swipe of her hand only to have to back up as dark flames were fired again at the man from Izuku. A woman jumped across a building top, using her hair made of green flames to get her across. She was a hero, more specifically a psychic, and was attempting to go dissolve the villain encounter that had a fire user in it, she would have been there already, having gotten to where the fight was first reported. But anyone involved was gone, just leaving scorch marks in the ground and spikes. The first sight made her believe the conflict, which was most likely two low-life criminals having a dispute, was over. Then she heard an explosion and saw flames and smoke rising above the buildings a few blocks away. Not hesitating she immediately made her way to the new area of conflict. Izuku cut off his stream of flames to lessen the strain, believing he finally put Kai into a state that would end the conflict. Izuku took a hard breath from being impaled again, albeit in not currently life-threatening spots, across his upper body from the cement. Once the flames cleared up it was revealed that the man was actually no longer in the spot he was last seen, not a single trace of him being there. The emerald boy tried to lower his guard and relax, believing it was over, before the ground below him shifted and a hand erupted upwards attempting to grab him. The emerald boy didn't react himself quick enough but luckily for him Momo did and managed to yank him just out of reach of the hand as more of the arm and even the upper body of Kai emerged from the ground. Kai had gained a slightly ragged look like healing himself during the fight was taking energy and that each time he healed himself it took parts of him to patch up the rest. Why not give me a name before I erase your existence Kai asked at what was an odd time to ask as he went after Izuku again. The boy dodging as he flared his fire back and attempted to blast the man with a flame. Izuku scowled as he was definitely not at a level of training and control to keep this fight going much longer. Even with the new power he gained saving his life and saving him from serious injury after serious injury. Izuku needed to actually wrap this up quickly and needed a way to do it soon. Assessing the situation he knew the man wouldn't kill Momo, needing her for whatever villainous things he does. The man also clearly had a huge amount of hate for Izuku that was earned well in the short time they have known each other. So it was unlikely that the man would exactly just leave with Momo without killing Izuku first. That idea was proven with the man focusing solely on Izuku and only attacking or dealing with Momo as she made herself an issue, before just going back to Izuku as his focus. Izuku figured he could use this to his advantage. Momo get help. Izuku shouted as he blasted himself backwards away from Kai and used a tendril to throw Momo, more of a toss to not harm her, down the alley away from Kai before he made more tendrils to attack Kai. Momo can use that chance to actually get reinforcements and not be in this man's clutches anymore, while Izuku can just find a solution to dealing with the man in a better situation of not having to worry for her being in the crossfire, especially if he can go full force with his fire without concern. I don't want to leave you, Momo shouted as she tried to actually go back to the fight. Kai, unexpectedly to Izuku, used the tendrils attacking him and used his own quirk to manipulate them and launch himself with force at the boy. This is the end boy. He attempted to grab Izuku who brought up his arms with his fire roaring to protect himself. No, Momo shouted as she tried to run faster. Kai grabbed Izuku by both of his bracers and made to disassemble the boy, ending the little bastard for good. 
In that single millisecond Izuku felt panic before everything went to chaos. Endeavor finally got within a few block of the fight. Seeing the fire helped him find it before suddenly a huge explosion of dark flames burst from the fighting area and shook the city, even all the way where Endeavor was. The green-flamed haired woman was knocked into a building right as she was about to interrupt the fight, dark flames seemingly bursting from everywhere for a second. She was blessed for sure that she was even as fire-resistant as she was because even her higher tolerance for flames was being stressed from the flames that thankfully were gone before there were any lasting effects. She got up from her position against the wall and the first person she saw was a young girl who was badly burnt, on her back looking blankly up at the sky. Shit, the flame-haired woman cursed as she tried to quickly check on the girl and was relieved that she was alive, and actually still conscious, even if barely. The girl had an unfocused look towards the sky that turned towards the hero slowly as she was being helped. Can you understand me right now? The heroine asked to receive a weak nod. Okay, I'm getting you to safety so she was interrupted as another flash of flames burst down the alley, followed by a scream of pain. Izuku was in the middle of what was an extreme pain, eclipsing everything he had experienced in the past six months all at once. His arms felt like they were being stabbed over and over again, and the fire was doing nothing to ease that. His fire was out of control, going off in waves of intensity. The flames were so out of control that they were beginning to burn even Izuku, the flesh surrounding his forearms beginning to burn. Izuku was barely able to remember what happened that made it like this. From the second the man tried to kill Izuku and grabbed the boy by the metal bracers on his arms everything became a blur of pain and fire. His bracers were no longer what they should be, the ornate ashen metal they had been for the past half a year. Instead the metal pieces had cracked and spiked out all over the place around his arms and seemingly were writhing out of control just like his powers themselves were. The boy tried to rein in his fire only for a shockwave of pain to hit him and make him fall to his knees, his consciousness blurring as he was losing focus on his surrounding. He had to regain control. He had to, before anything gets worse. Izuku tried to regain control, pulling on those evil powers within him as hard as he could, pushing through the pain. His fire exploded with new force that made him release an intense scream of pain as something forced itself into his mind. A memory that didn't belong. A single sentence that was never spoken. To him, I am Leviat Malam, and I shall take this land and lead it into a new age at the helm of the world. Izuku collapsed into unconsciousness at that point, not able to even process what he heard or who had just stepped near him before everything went black. Moments later Endeavor had a horrified look as he knelt down next to the unconscious Izuku whose fire had died down to just sparks. He was too late to get there, even knowing and rushing as fast as he could to stop something like this from happening. Izuku's arms were badly burnt and his bracers had gained a contorted shape where it was broken in half of the spots, with an odd black mass coating parts of it. Various wounds, cuts and burns were all over Izuku as well, each one putting another weight on Inji's worry and guilt. What did you do Midoriya? The man asked for no reason at all, knowing he couldn't get an answer from his student. The man grit his teeth as his worry swapped to anger. Anger at himself for not getting here quick enough to save his student, the kid that was cursed because of him. The flaming man punched the ground as hard as he could in frustration. Damn it. The ground cracked and so did two of Endeavor's knuckles. Ignoring his hand he carefully picked up his student who was surely on death's door. He had to make sure that Izuku wouldn't die here. He couldn't let the boy that was cursed to a life of pain because of him die like this. Stay with me Izuku. Kai collapsed against the ground what should be a block away from where the conflict with that kid took place. Too exhausted to move further in that moment as he tried to even check his health and body. The man didn't feel his right arm, or even his left for that matter, and upon looking done he saw the reason for that. He didn't have them, they were missing just below his elbow and downward. His arms weren't even bleeding as the wound was burned completely to a messed up stump. The man groaned in pain from half of his body. The explosive force of what was what he assumed to be a last-ditch attack from the boy had wrecked his body and could have been the end of Kai had luck not been on his side. He wasn't even sure how he had gotten this far away. Shouldn't those heroes be all over the area an armless man with this many injuries would definitely be noticed. If he was somehow getting this chance to escape and retreat back to his base then he shouldn't waste it. He struggled to stand up before crashing to his knees again. His exhaustion taking a heavy toll. He wasn't even thinking about finding Momo or anything at that point past getting back to his hideout before he succumbed to his wounds. That and how much he hated that boy who even in his death found a way to make Kai hate him more. Momo blinked as her ability to focus was regained. She was now completely aware of her surroundings and the knowledge of those surroundings being an ambulance settled in. Where am I going? Her throat was too sore to get full sentences out in one go. Try to relax. A paramedic said as he did his best to keep her wounds from getting worse until she could be put in a hospital. You are safe now. Safe was she really? Momo couldn't actually believe that. After so long being in that man's clutches it felt weird to believe she was safe. Before she could think more she slipped unconscious again. 
Enji walked into the lobby of the hospital where he knew he was needed, not by any media or law enforcement but something more important at that moment. The most important thing he could do in that moment was wait right there to be there when she got there, and to explain what happened. A few minutes later she arrived, and Ko, rushing into the lobby and immediately seeing the towering man she moved to him with a scared expression. Where is he? Midoriya is in intensive care right now. The flaming man answered with more worry in his voice than he had for 90% of his life so far. What happened? They do not know so far. The only two people who were involved were Midoriya and a girl, who are both not conscious and are being treated right now for their wounds. Is he is he going to be alright? They don't know yet. Enji was upset he had nothing but shit answers at the moment. He hated this situation, not knowing if his student would pull through or not. Why couldn't the doctors know yet? They believe the girl will be awake again today and at that time they will try to figure out what happened. But Midoriya is unknown to them. They believe he has actually entered a coma. At that point Inko couldn't control it and began to sob, scared of what would happen to her son. Later after she was left alone, having to earlier recount what happened to a police officer, Momo was left with her thoughts. Momo was not sure what she was going to do at this point. She really was safe, no longer near her father. It was thanks to him, that emerald boy who kept pushing himself to save her, who made her find courage for the first time in her life. Someone who also had a curse like her and put his fear aside to save someone who needed it in a situation that he struggled through but still pushed himself to get through it. He was her hero, her hero who died to make her have freedom. Momo actually began to tear up at that point, not wanting to imagine that the emerald boy was dead. But there was no way he was alive. She saw Kai grab the boy and Momo knew that Kai can and will blow apart anyone he touches with his quirk if he chose to. She now had freedom but at the cost of his life. She just wished she could see him again, to thank that boy who had become her cursed hero. It took not even the rest of the day for every media outlet in Musutafu to have gotten their hands on every bit of information they could on the event that was dubbed the fire that shook Musutafu and reported. That wasn't necessarily a surprising thing as reporters all acted fast any time any sort of hero. Villain activity happened if they could help it. However this was also about Izuku and Inji didn't particularly like the idea of the boy's secret getting outed or him gaining any unwanted attention due to this whole mess. So far the media had actually gained Izuku's name. Someone must have asked around the hospital, and had already begun spinning tales of how Endeavor and the boy were connected. Endeavor's anger and despair when finding the boy earlier that day made it seem clearly personal to most with the flaming hero's typical lack of emotion like that during his job. The flaming man was in the middle of an internal debate but had to put it aside to deal with the current situation. Everything that girl Izuku had saved that she told them. After her being questioned about the whole event it was clear that Izuku had fought a man who was a criminal and part of an organization, specifically the Yakuza. No one liked what information she was able to give, that he was using her quirk to create weapons and materials to arm themselves to a high degree. She only knew as much as she did because the man, his name being Kai Chisaki, or overhaul with his quirk and title, didn't seem to mind saying parts in front of her. Partially due to her being his daughter and his quirk and presence frightened the girl too much for her to do anything. Up until today that was. Now that she was free and currently being watched by two of his sidekicks, Endeavor's agency had to make plans about what happens now. This whole thing falling into their laps due to jurisdiction and Endeavor specifically trying to handle it since his student was now in a coma because of it. Entering his agency he walked right past one of his sidekicks who immediately began to keep pace with the man as he walked. What do the police say the flaming hero asked his psychic, a young man with the ability to shoot beams of fire from his eyes. They last said just a few minutes ago that they still have no trace of overhaul anywhere after a few blocks. His trail just stops and so far after combing that immediate area there is no sign of where he went. The psychic was worried that Endeavor would be pissed, everyone noticing how quickly he was getting agitated over the whole situation. None of the people at Endeavor's agency were even aware of his having a student in the boy. But the news made it clear when someone had actually got a recording of Endeavor's anger at finding his student in critical condition that the kid meant a good deal to the man. And she did end up scowling slightly. That bastard got away as they entered an area with cubicles Endeavor spoke up. I want half of you to join the search for the next few hours. Yes sir. Most of the people working under Endeavor said as some of them began to head out at a fast pace. If he was as injured as someone should have been from that blast then he shouldn't have gotten far on his own. Endeavor looked at a map of the area pinned up on a board. Someone had to have shown up to help that bastard. Which is extremely likely as his group could have gotten paranoid over his not showing back up sooner and the whole fight definitely got people's attention. Sir there is still the matter of the girl. Overhaul wants her and if he did in fact get away he could always come back for her, or his group could continue his work. Endeavor looked annoyed at having to not focus in getting the villain but did change his focus regardless. He would have to do something with that Momo girl. 
Overhaul would definitely try to get her again and Endeavor would be damned if he let all his students' efforts go to waste. I will set up arrangements. Endeavor didn't really elaborate further since he planned on keeping the arrangements known to as little people as possible. Whenever he did figure out the arrangements, Momo really didn't like hospitals at all. It felt too much like where her father had her kept. She wanted to leave but she also didn't know where she would even go, or if she could even go anywhere. She knew that someone was always outside her door and keeping watch so that nothing unwanted could happen. She didn't even know what she would do either. She now had her freedom but it just felt heavy. It felt like too much and something she shouldn't have, at least not in exchange for the Emerald Boy's life. Her train of thought kept coming back to him, not letting go of the fact that he sacrificed his own life to save her from her father. Momo would have kept along this line of thinking if the door to her room didn't open. The person who opened the door was massive. Momo didn't know someone else who was his size. It actually felt kind of intimidating. Hello Momo. The man had a gruff voice but at least wasn't mean sounding. I am Endeavor. I'm in charge of the situation and it's clean up. Momo nodded and said a quiet hello. For the time being we are making plans to keep you safe so you don't have to worry about Chisaki or that group. No one past a few of us will know your whereabouts during the next few months. However I am also here for another reason. Endeavor leaned forward in the seat he was sitting in. Can you tell me what happened near the end to Izuku only you were there to see it? Momo was confused for all of half a second before she realized that Izuku was the name of her hero. Izuku he used one of his tentacles to throw me away from them and told me to run I didn't want to I wanted to stay with him. She looked down at her lap and began to tear up. She couldn't get past the guilt of him now being dead. Father grabbed him and killed him he's dead and it's not fair. And she blinked, confused at first about her outburst and tears before he caught on. She believed Izuku was dead. To be fair it does make sense when that man overhaul can kill with a single touch and she saw him grab Izuku. That was actually why Inji was here in the first place, to find out why Izuku was somehow lucky to live past that moment. Izuku is not dead Momo, the flaming man stated. Momo gained wide eyes as she looked back up at the man. What? He is heavily injured and here in the hospital too. Izuku is alive. A huge weight was removed from Momo and she began to cry again, but in relief and happiness as her hero was still alive. Inji sat there feeling awkward, not sure what to really do in that moment, but deciding on continuing his question. How did Chisaki grab Izuku? Momo wiped her eyes and thought for a second. That moment was engraved in her mind so it didn't take long to remember. By the things he had on his arms. She moved her forearms as she spoke. Inji nodded. It made sense now a bit how Izuku was alive. Those supernatural bracers of his must have had a reaction to Chisaki grabbing them and trying to break them. Had Izuku been grabbed by any other part of himself he very well could have died right then. The flaming man sighed in relief at the luck of that moment. He then asked another question. Can you tell me about the tentacles he held up a paper, the page of the book that he believed those tentacles could actually be? Did they look like this? The girl looked at the torn page for a second before nodding. His tentacles looked like that. They came out of the things. She moved her forearms again. The flaming man nodded. It made sense that the tendrils came out of the bracers themselves, just like the fire. Thank you for your time Momo. I must go now. He got up. Can can I see Izuku Momo asked. She wanted to thank him so much for everything. And his being alive was one of the best things to happen, next to Izuku saving her from Chisaki. Izuku is currently in a coma. Enji really didn't like reminding himself of that fact. Momo looked back at her lap, some of her sadness returning at that news. Oh. A moment later Endeavor exhaled hard as he began to head over to the elevator and leave this hospital. He really hated how terrible everything became. This day wasn't easy and he needed a break. A single minute to just not have to stress about this mess. But he wouldn't allow that since he had a lot of work to do. The man winced slightly as he grabbed his right hand, the one that he had cracked two of the knuckles on. He had to at least figure out Momo's situation moving forward now before the night was over. Ma'am, ma'am you can't go through there. A person, one of his psychics, was heard trying to stop someone. Endeavor turned to see a woman walking through the hall right towards him. A man in a suit following her and blocking Endeavor's psychic. Where's my daughter? The woman looked straight at the flaming pro hero, ignoring the psychic trying to stop her. Endeavor gained a hard look as he realized who he was looking at. It was Miyako Yeyurazu. He never properly met the woman but knew exactly who she was. A powerful woman in Japan with far influence and possibly enough wealth to find everything in Japan herself for a decent amount of time if she felt like it. Endeavor didn't say anything as he tried to process why she would be here of all places, not sure why she thought he knew about her daughter. Your daughter the man asked to get an answer. Momo, I know she is here. I saw the news and know that your student fought Kai and got my daughter away from that self-absorbed asshole. Whereas she the woman was now in front of Endeavor and had a hard expression that matched the expression Endeavor used to have. The man had to think for a second. Was Miyako really Momo's mother upon looking at this woman the resemblance was uncanny. The same hair color, eye color, face and everything matched except expression and hairstyle itself. 
However, what if she was in any way connected to overhaul in a sense that letting her see Momo would be bad for the young girl he wasn't sure if it would be the right call. Miyako, as if she was reading his mind, spoke. I am only connected to Kai through the fling we had that birthed Momo. Let me see my daughter or everyone here would live to regret it. Being threatened made Endeavor want to tell her to off. However he couldn't say that because of who this woman was. Miyako absolutely would destroy everyone if she wanted to, having the power and influence to do so very easily. He'd be a fool to tick her off that way. He decided to go with letting her see the child to avoid any issues at the moment, but was going to make sure nothing went wrong as well. She is back that way, he indicated behind him. Vernon can show you and she will stay there to keep watch over Momo as well. He said the name of the first psychic he saw when he looked up. The young girl he titled looked up in surprise. Yes sir, Vernon replied with a slight nervousness at being selected by the man. Vernon, or more Kamiji as her actual name was, was a young woman with big dark eyes and pointy teeth and long hair made of green flames. Miyako showed no care about that arrangement. All right, she began to move around endeavor to go to her daughter. The pro hero sighed as he suddenly felt exhausted just knowing that the girl Momo was connected to Miyako of all people. Izuku really had to save her daughter out of all people. Vernon attempted to open the door to the room that Momo was in, only for Miyako to do it herself. The woman walked in and saw Momo on the bed, sitting there doing nothing but just looking at her lap while thinking. That changed when the people came in and the girl looked at them. Momo was the first to speak. Mother she was confused to see her mom for the first time in years. Miyako was immediately across the room and hugging her daughter. Oh my sweet child it really is you. I heard Kai had karmic justice and hoped so badly that it was you who was saved. They didn't catch him, Momo stated, overhearing from the adults outside, that the man was still out there. Oh please, that scum was beaten by a child. It is pure defeat of his ego that satisfies me. So how did they do it how they shove it to that man she held her daughter by the shoulders and looked her in the eyes. Izuku used fire and these tentacles to fight father. He kept getting injured but kept fighting because he said he wasn't going to let father hurt me anymore. Miyako had a soft smile. What a sweet little knight. I'll thank the boy myself for saving you. Izuku is in a coma. The young girl pointed out, with very noticeable sadness. I want to see him but he's not awake. The matriarch pursed her lips. I suppose that's the risk of fighting Kai of all people. It is a miracle the boy managed to even challenge him at his age, let alone survive and win. Perhaps Endeavor is a great mentor. Ma'am, Vernon, who was sitting at a chair while the other two spoke. Not to interrupt but how exactly do you know Overhaul? Miyako looked annoyed at the mention of the man. We met years ago and I thought he was a simple ruffian. In my younger years I felt rebellious and tried to have a fling with Kai who you know is a Yakuza. However I quickly found out, after Momo was already conceived, that he is far worse than he lets on, especially around you people. What do you mean? You people Burnin didn't know how to take that comment. Pro heroes, people with quirks. He finds all that disgusting. I'm quirkless so he probably saw me as pure or clean. He kept a level of civility around me and it made me think I could change him. A foolish idea. Once Momo got her quirk he kidnapped her and disappeared. Not even my resources could find the bastard. She paused as she patted her daughter's shoulder. I haven't seen you in almost seven years. I am sorry I let myself gain the idea that I could do anything to give that man humanity. The young girl didn't say anything, but nodded to show she was listening and understood. Miyako looked at Burnin. I will fund Endeavor's agency personally if it means you people can catch that bastard and make him pay for taking away my daughter's childhood. The flaming sidekick paused before responding. I'm pretty sure Endeavor himself wants to make that man pay for messing up his student. We're in agreement then. Make that man pay for messing with our kids. She paused again. Let me see this is a coup. I want to see the face of the kid who saved my daughter. Vernon gave the woman a look. She wanted to point out the child was in a coma but didn't because Miyako just had that energy of don't say no to her. I'll see what I can do. Enji had only just walked in his house, feeling mentally tired and just done for the day, when a hard object was sent into his forehead. You just couldn't leave other kids out of your damn shit. The person who threw something was actually his 14-year-old son Natsuo. The kid had a glare towards his father, wishing he had thrown more than just one of his school textbooks at the man. First Talia, then Shoto. Now you got another kid sent to the hospital. Enji ignored the new bruise on his forehead from the math textbook and focused on his son, not even having an angry look at all. How many people do you have to hurt before you realize you're a ing problem? The young teen normally wouldn't have dared trying to speak so harshly and boldly to his father but to him this was past the limit. He saw the news and knew instantly that Endeavor had to have been pushing this Izuku kid the same way he had to both of Natsuo's brothers. The man didn't actually speak for a moment. Six months ago, what Natsuo gained a look of confusion. Six months ago I realized that I was a problem. I had inadvertently cursed that boy to hardships and was a failure to Talia. Enji's internal battle that his son had just interrupted was actually over this very thing. 
I tried to write the wrong I did to Midoriya, because I didn't want him to end up like Taoya. And this is what you do make him end up in Natsuo stopped when a hand was on his shoulder, being his older sister Fayumi. The girl had heard the yelling through the house once and knew she would have to defuse a situation before it got blown out of proportion. This wasn't Dan's fault, Fayumi stated. She actually doesn't know how her father was even blaming himself right here. It's not like he specifically told Izuku to fight a villain. She knew it was most likely Izuku who pushed himself to fight the villain. Dan tried to help Midoriya control his flames so he wouldn't get hurt. Midoriya couldn't control them at all and they hurt him a lot. Dad was helping him. Natsuo gave his sister a hard look, just for the fact that he couldn't believe his father wasn't being an asshole here somehow. But no, how is it possible that it isn't his fault when almost everyone who is close to this guy is either in a hospital, dead or hates his gut? Fayumi didn't answer, but Anji did. It is my fault. If not for me Midoriya would not have ended up in a situation where he would even try to fight a villain. Everything else is my fault too. I am completely at fault for what happened to Talia. The man gained a depressed look as he said that. Every horrible thing that has happened in this family is because of me. The kids didn't say anything for a second. Natsuo did speak and at his fists. Do you expect us to forgive you because you now admit you are an asshole he wouldn't forgive his father at all? Enji answered without hesitation. No no, you shouldn't forgive me. That threw Natsuo off. What? Everything I have done is too much to be forgiven. Enji then realized something he had to do. Something to fix one of his biggest mistakes. I have to go. He said as he turned for the front door. Where are you going Fayumi asked with a really concerned look. To atone for my mistakes. Enji said as he left to go see his wife. Soon after the request was made, Miyako stood on the other side of the glass and looked into an operating room where a team of doctors were working on fixing the kid who saved Momo. Her expression was unreadable as she took notice of everything about the boy that she could. The numerous wounds he gained fighting Kai. That odd burnt metal all over his arms, even his regular features like his hair and freckles. It was important to the woman to take note of every detail of the kid since he was clearly important after the events of the day. She wondered when the child would wake up, mostly because she planned to set up a meeting, a proper meeting between the boy and her daughter. In the short time she had reunited with Momo she easily understood that this boy had become important to her as a hero, and Miyako couldn't disagree at all. The state the boy put himself into was an impressive showing of his willpower and she thought it outshined most adults in the profession of being heroes. Perhaps she should endorse and fund him becoming one of them or a better version of them, something he was well on his way to doing. Enji Todoroki stood at the desk, feeling a sinking feeling in his gut as he waited for an okay or a denial of his request. He hasn't been to this psychiatric ward in years. It felt awkward to be here knowing that he was the reason she was even put in here at all. He had doubts that it would be allowed for him to see here. 1. Because of his being a cause of her instability. 2. Because it was getting later at night. The odds of her being awake at this hour may not be the best. The man prayed that Ray would let him see her, even if he didn't deserve it. He needed to make amends, begin fixing everything he had wronged. He had to start here, with Ray who he had begun wronging first. To do endeavor sir. A woman behind the desk looked at the man while covering the bottom half of a phone. Dr. Hikari says it should be possible. Miss Todoroki is awake right now and has said she is surprised but willing to see you. Inji nodded. Thank you. It's this way correct he pointed down a hall and received a nod. Room 315. The woman replied. Enji nodded and began going down the hall. Every step felt heavy to the man, and heavier as he kept going. He used to never think twice about his horrible actions. But ever since his recklessness had caused Izuku to become cursed half a year prior it had been building up and becoming worse. Now, after today, that guilt was an overwhelming force that he wasn't sure he could actually face. It had taken a toll on his heart and mind and that toll kept growing as he continuously ran everything through his thoughts. As he approached the door, the one belonging to room 315, he tried to open it. He had put his hand on the door and pushed it only a few inches before he stopped. Did he deserve to be before her at this point to make her see the man who was a horrible person to her he didn't even have a proper idea of what he was going to say or do? He knew he wanted to apologize, to seek atonement. But how was he supposed to put everything into words? Without any real idea of what to do, the man let out a breath and put his forehead against the door that was still slightly open. It was open enough to see only a fraction of the room, not any part that had Ray in it. Leaving the door how it was, Enji spoke. Ray, I messed up. I messed up horribly and it took me too long to realize that. He didn't hear any sound of response at all, but hoped that the door was open enough that Ray heard him. I am a fool that forced issues onto others and created more for people who didn't deserve them. You most of all. It took me until my actions forced a random child to have to go through pain that won't leave him for the rest of his life to realize how badly I treated you and the kids. I, I don't know how to even begin atoning for these sins. I need to, have to, atone for them. I have no excuses, no ideas how to fix this, but I will. I'm sorry. The man stopped at that point. 
He didn't know what else to say. He took his hand off the door and let it close. He didn't know if he should stay there, if he should have said anything at all, if he should have even made her know he was there at all. The man let out another heavy breath and began to walk away, hoping that Ray had heard him. She didn't need to forgive him, he didn't deserve that, but he wanted her to know that he truly was sorry. A few seconds later, after the man had left, the door was pulled open and the woman inside looked at the empty hallway with a heavy expression. Despite insistence that her daughter should stay under their watch, Miyako used her resources to actively give back protection and watch over her daughter to herself. A heated discussion with the people involved in the case went on for close to half an hour of bickering before Miyako was able to take Momo and she set out to immediately head back home. In the back of a car she looked at her daughter, who was silently sitting there next to her. Momo had no issues leaving the hospital, although at one point she did say she didn't want to leave without seeing Izuku. Miyako and all the police and heroes agreed on that one thing that it wouldn't be good for Momo to see the boy in the condition he was in. The young Yeyarazu almost showed her mother's stubbornness for a moment before she nodded and stopped protesting her case. As much as I think it'd be nice for you to see the mansion again, we won't be going back there. Miyako started speaking. Kai knows where that is and while I would love to see him, or any of his stooges, try to step foot there, I don't feel like letting you be near that. So where are we going Momo asked. I have a place near the coast that I purchased just two years ago. Kai does not know about that for sure. The matriarch replied. I already asked Seike to begin setting up a better level of security at the place so you'll be safe from any of those fools who would attempt to cross a Yayarazu. Momo nodded and it went silent for a moment while she began to look out the car window at the night sky. Miyako looked back at her daughter after a few moments of silence. Dear, I know it should be left alone now. But what exactly did that man do to you? It began to nag at Miyako seeing how damaged her daughter looked emotionally. Her years of learning how to read people told her too much seeing the mix of emotions in Momo's eyes. He kept making me make parts for weapons and things, money too. After a while he began to use overhaul on me. If there was ever a look of someone who wished to rip someone's throat out, it was on Miyako's face hearing that last part. Why? He said my quirk was a curse, that all of them were too. He wanted to take my flesh and use it for testing I think. I don't know what he did with it but he kept taking some. The elder Yeirazu took a breath. I am glad that Izuku saved you. How did he even find you though she didn't think it'd be realistic to believe the ten-year-old just marched into a Yakuza hideout. I tried to run away. Something told me to keep pushing myself to escape. I managed to lose one of the men father had, but then he himself came after me. I wanted to give up but ran into Izuku in the middle of the street, so he saw you fleeing and stepped in. Momo turned. Red. No. I accidentally ran right into him. Miyako let out a laugh. That's one way to get his attention. You ran into the right person though. Momo nodded. I hope he will be okay. Everything was black and seemingly endless. In every direction he couldn't feel anything, like he was in the middle of this dark void. Leviat my lord, it is time for you to claim your crown and lead the Roman Empire. What was his name Leviat it didn't feel like it was. His name felt like it was something else. Izumid or he wasn't sure. Suddenly the black void he was in shifted, becoming a building around him and a balcony that he was leaning on, overlooking a city that felt wrong for him to see, but for some reason felt like home. Without thinking he turned to face a man who he felt like he could trust with his life. This man had pale green eyes and black, back hair save for a bit that hung over the left side of his head, and noticeable facial hair growing into a goatee. He was wearing a black shirt with a high collar and a brown jacket. His black pants were tucked into a pair of brown boots. The man had a smile. Are you ready? Lord Leviat the man asked. That's right, his name was Leviat Malum. Not whatever thing he confused himself with. He made a grin as he stopped leaning on the balcony. Of course, it is a grand day to become king isn't it Malishi? Malishi's arm shifted into several tendrils that were black in color and red thick red veins on them. Shame that some people won't get to see the rest of it. Leviat's grin turned sinister as dark flames flickered in several spots all over him. A real shame. In the operating room Izuku was kept in a dark feeling filled the air slowly. The black mass still on his body slowly vibrating in reaction. Walking down the hall Leviat had his expression set to a smug smirk as he planned out the next few minutes, which no doubt would feel chaotic to others. Not Leviat however, where others would feel anxious or worried to even the slightest degree from what could easily be described as enacting a hostile takeover, Leviat felt no worries. Not even for a second was Leviat anything but pleased. And if he felt anxious, it was an excitement and eagerness of claiming his empire. Who wouldn't feel excited or eager from that though the feeling of that rush, envisioning in quick flashes all of the possibilities he could enact and accomplishments he could achieve as the ruler of Rome. It all was perhaps the most excited Leviat had been in the twenty years he had lived. Have all of the council arrived yet Leviat asked calmly, looking at his loyal right-hand militia. The dark-haired man nodded with a sadistic smile, not bothering to hide his true persona no more. They have indeed. They are simply waiting for us. If only they knew. 
It would take away the joy of seeing their fear as it begins. Malishi stated. That will be humorous. Leviat gave a laugh. I cannot imagine my own reaction if I was part of the council who are here to be betrayed. You would turn it on them. Especially as you are now, my lord. Malishi responded, showing his admiration of the man. That is likely. With what we have obtained it would be easy to turn the situation to my favor. Leviat and Malishi approached a door, which was guarded by two men in royal decorated uniforms. No one but higher ups in the army being trusted to be security for the council. However Leviat wasn't concerned about these two soldiers or any members of the council. He knew how this would all play out here today. By the time the sun set this day on the holy city, Leviat would be its unopposed ruler. Sir Malam, both of the soldiers greeted him, Leviat giving them a nod as they opened large doors for the two lords to enter the council's chambers. I would ignore any sounds of disputes from this council today, the man suggested as he walked in, not looking at the two guards he was speaking to. It will just be the heat working people up. The two guards nodded as they closed the doors. Malishi, please make sure that door doesn't open while I see who will among the council has sense in their being. Upon Leviat giving his order the man who served as his right hand stopped to stand in front of the only doors leading in and out of the hall. No one shall get past me. Malishi made a sinister look. Leviat smiled as he walked down the small stretch of hall before getting to the area where he would take control. A circular area of a room with a table in the middle with seats around it. Ten in total, nine of which had people sitting in them already. He paid no attention to their debate. No doubt some unnecessary argument that had little to do with anything but money. The fools cared for nothing but filling their pockets and Leviat knew this after spending only a short time of just months among them. Once he stepped to the table Leviat didn't bother moving to the seat that he had gained through manipulation and cunning. Instead he stood and waited for them to take notice. After a moment they took notice. Leviat, a grizzled past soldier turned politician was the first to speak, a man like the rest of the council that Leviat barely knew the name of, as he never bothered to learn. Due to his young age it was easy to call everyone by titles that made them feel like Leviat respected them when he was only waiting till he could walk over them on his path to the top. You are late. Quite so. The young man agreed. I would have preferred for this to happen much earlier. But perhaps the path and wait make this moment much, much better to enjoy. What are you talking about boy another of the members? Another older man asked. What do you know of the soul Leviat decided on letting them all know how out of their league he had become? I don't mean... What you believe wrongly that happened in scriptures, but what our souls truly are he paused his talking to let someone speak. Don't speak ill of God. The first man responded. I take that as no one knows none of you among this council, a council that is in control of this grand empire, are truly aware of. Our souls and the power therein I find myself shocked. He scoffed at that moment. Then again it does mean I am truly one of my own league and caliber. You better have a point here. Two separate people said at the same time, showing annoyance with Leviat and his words. I have a point. The young lord grinned evilly. I just thought to let you all know what kind of power will be in charge once you are killed. At that several people stood up to protest that statement when Leviat burst with flames, the blast knocking them either back into their seats or onto the floor. Leviat's left hand was lit ablaze with red flames, flowing from his arm without harming it at all. He held his hand up and looked at the flames himself. What in the lord's name? The second man asked. This is the power of my soul, Leviat started, a power I will use as I become the king of Rome. You think you can usurp this council and the emperor? The old war hawk had drawn a short blade. The flaming man gained an annoyed look. You question my capabilities when you see just a glimpse of my power I don't think you were ever wise enough to be on this council and I have no use for you in my new empire. Leviat pointed his arm at the man and unceremoniously shot of flames at him which hit the aged man's and quickly set him on fire, the red flames making decent work of burning away at the man whose life was ending quickly. The rest of the council were either looking at the burning man or at Leviat in fear. Have you communed with the devil the closest person to the fiery young man asked? I have already said what this is, do not make a fool of yourself. The flaming killer had an annoyed look. You really think these dark arts make you a god? You, I find that statement to be annoying. Leviat cut him off as he walked around the table towards his next victim. A god implies I am one on equal standing with another being. He felt that it would be a waste of time to talk to these people further. He really wanted to make them all feel terror and beg for their lives but instead they'd all rather foolishly question Leviat's power. He pulled more on the power in his soul and his flames intensified. Slick, charred black armor of sorts appearing on his forearms during that moment. I am not a god the cursed flame user said as he sent out his fire in a wave at the rest of the people in the room. I am, God. A jolt shook Izuku to awareness, snapping his mind back into place as he regained his memories. All of his ten and a half years of life hitting him at once. The emerald boy's head was a mess as he tried to figure out what had happened to him. 
The memory of what happened in that alley, that man grabbing Izuku's bracers, made him gain worry as he looked down at his arms, and then seeing his arms gave him more worry. His arms were invisible, actually they were translucent, a full grey color like a fog. In fact his whole body was like this. Another big note he noticed was that for some reason his arms lacked the bracers completely, like they never existed. Before he could worry more about that he also realized that he was in a sitting position, in a chair he couldn't distinguish what it was made from. Looking around he saw that he was in a dimly lit room at the end of a table. That table from his dream months ago. Except this time it was more visible, as well as the area around it. The table had three seats on either side of it. Each seat seemingly had a shadow or a thing that Izuku could not make out, the light being too dark to make anything out properly there, save for one of the seats on the sides of the table. In the farthest seat away from Izuku on the right side, the shadow instead had a sand or tan coloring, glowing noticeably. Izuku couldn't make out any discernible features of this person. However in front of this person on the table a design that Izuku didn't understand was carved into the furniture, itself glowing with the same sand-like color, and a line from it was carved outwards further into the table, leading towards the center of the table to a much larger design. This central design had little glow to it other than the lines throughout that were filled in by the sand-colored lines. On either side of this design's central section were thick lines that led to either ends of the table, one end stopping on the table in front of Izuku and the other going to the end where the only thing Izuku had seen last time was, that chair that was on fire. Izuku didn't know why but he felt a sinister feeling looking at that seat across from him, the red flames giving him nothing but bad vibes. Hearing the heartbeat and seeing the form of a person sitting there motionless whole burning away made the hairs on Izuku's neck stand up, so he took to looking at the room itself. He couldn't see any walls around him or anything, making the emerald teen wonder if this was in fact not a room. It could have just been that the room was too dark for him to see that far. However the burning flames across from him made Izuku question why it was so dark here. Izuku tried to move from his seat and felt a burning sensation in his forearms. The room or whatever the place was began to shake as charred fragments of metal sprouted from Izuku's forearms, causing a pain he couldn't scream from let alone bear. The boy's voice was gone and his screams became empty as he tried to cry out from the pain. Not even a full second later a shock of a burning feeling filled Izuku's person and his mind went blank. A blast of fire shook the hospital room as Izuku jolted up to a sitting position, gasping for breath and pain filling his forearms to the point of almost numbness. The kid looked at himself and his surroundings as he processed everything that happened. It was almost too much to believe he had witnessed any fraction of Leviat's life, especially since it showed he was a man who lived a long time ago and absolutely ruthless. The kid sighed and looked down at his arms that were still stinging from pain and gained confusion as he processed that the bracers had changed. They were indeed broken apart. The metal split into pieces that littered Izuku's forearms like someone stabbed them into him. No proper magma effects were present like they used to be and Izuku could see the skin of his forearms for the first time in months. He saw pale flesh with burned scars around the edges of where the metal used to start and end. Along those scars were like specks of a black mass that Izuku remembered belonged to his second power. Upon remembering that he thought about what he just saw, the table and those seats, the fire. That clearly had to do with how this curse worked, and why he had two different powers now. Was the curse a collection it had to be, and each seat had someone else there? Izuku tried to think about and figure out the meaning but all it did was make him feel tired. The idea of there being more to this curse than just the fire, and the bracers placed a weight on the already pressured child. Izuku stared at the bracers and let out a breath. Why me? 